Welcome to The Lux Files, a podcast for occultists about occultists. I'm your host, Sean, and I hope you enjoy this episode. Be sure to subscribe to The Lux Files wherever you get your podcasts to stay up to date on all the new episodes. Hello, everyone. Back for round two on The Lux Files is Michelle Boulanger, author, psychic, occultist, television personality. I can go on and on, but I won't. Hello, Michelle. Hello. How are you? I'm doing pretty good. Wonderful. Just go. You know, just just getting by. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I hear you. I hear you. Uh, there's something new that you can add to your bio, and I dare say, probably the most important thing, you are the first returning guest to the podcast. Oh, cool. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. So, you know, that's that's. <laughs> and what did I say about the dogs? So I've got the seal of approval. Yeah, yeah, they love you. So thank you guys. Thanks. Now be quiet. Uh, yeah. So uh, things are good. Keeping busy. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Excellent. Yeah. Most recently I've been doing a lot of remote work. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and by that, I mean, remote psychic work. So, okay. so okay. viewing locations remotely for a couple of different teams. Excellent. And how's that going? pretty fun it's uh it's neat sort of to to stretch my my legs with that like i do a lot of remote energy work and ritual work as mm -hmm. part of my practice but haven't done like filmed on camera readings remotely from a location so that's, okay. that's been fun now has that been something <laughs> like you've never really explored um not officially on any of the shows uh, right. and it, it's 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 interesting because like I've been honestly I'm more comfortable doing a lot of remote work than I am physically being on the location not that I'm you know not, not for any reason that I'm scared of the location but that I find uh the physical place very distracting from the other stuff that I'm trying to perceive and, and I like as blank a slate as possible and the easiest way to do that is to not be there at all yeah yeah um, but uh, I don't so think that, a lot of times you go in yeah. and you're blindfolded. So that helps. But does that yeah. not help enough or it helps? It helps to some extent, but there's always some some information that I can't, you know, completely rule out. I'm, I'm going to know generally the region that I'm driving to hmm. or being flown to uh, and like, you know, time periods of activity in that location uh there's a lot of auditory and scent um yeah. other like information that you get especially when you take your eyes away like you i can tell if i'm walking into a big building if we're outside like there's, right. a, there's a bunch of things that like i can't uh, just can't ignore that yeah um, i mean a jail that's been shut down for 50 years and someone's home is going to smell slightly different Yes, they do. And, yeah. and once you've been in enough moldering old buildings, you start to go, hmm, smells like an asylum. Okay. Or, oh, I think this might be an old hospital. Oh. I was just going to ask that. Do they have, you know, you have the old asylums, the old jails and prisons, the old hospitals. Do they have different smells? It's a little bit more that the scent is different based on the construction material and sometimes mm -hmm. the age of the building. Right. So different masonry, if it's more of a stone, if it's more brick, if it's more a uh, cinder block, all of those have a slightly different smell, mm -hmm. uh, if, especially if they are older buildings in disrepair and there's a lot of moisture. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, you know, an old wood has a, has a particular scent. Yeah. So all of that is some information that starts to like, you know, your, your brain can't help but try to like put pieces together. Like that's how it's wired. Yeah, exactly. Oh, that's interesting. But it, like you're, you, you're going to kind of, I would assume, kind of go back to normal uh, with traveling and actually going to places, though. You know, what like. I, I mean, what I hope is that uh, shows and things will allow for a little bit of both. Mm -hmm. like, like, I think my ideal would be to have 
uh, a filmed sort of like pregame on the location before I've traveled there, before I've been told like what's going on to just do a reading from a distance and then okay. also do boots on the ground and sort of compare the two. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. That makes sense, that makes sense. I just want everything to go back to normal. Yeah. And, you know, mm -hmm. I, I, I knew, I, I know everything, like we're not gonna be in this perpetual state of, of mm -hmm. pandemic lockdown. You know, there's plenty of people out there that like, this is all done by the government to keep us inside and never do anything again. Okay, whatever, I mean, <laughs> like knock this up out. With your the family. government wants you to spend money. The government doesn't yeah. want you to sit in your house. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, so, like, I, I know things are going to go back to normal, but it wasn't like I got my first uh, my first vaccine on the seventh, and um, and when I booked it, like in my province, you had to book your first and second appointment at the same time. And back then, we were doing the four month. Um, mm -hmm. Between so my first, my second dose, I uh, was booked for the twenty seventh of September. Oh, I and yeah, but you know, then we got in this huge influx. Like I mean, in one week, uh, in, in second week of June, we got something like, and you know, our population is like thirty nine million in Canada. Um, we got in like twelve million doses in one week something like that. So, you know, all the mm -hmm. provinces were, were changing and adapting to the influx of, of, um, uh, of doses. So we were able to rebook our second doses earlier. So I was able to rebook my second dose for July 20th, which is it. Oh, I totally forgot. It's Canada Day today. I was going to say, yeah. Happy I, Canada I, Day. <laughs> what better way to spend Canada Day than with my American friends? Now, just for the record, everyone that's listening to this or watching this, this isn't actually going out on Canada Day. So I do know when Canada Day is. So <laughs> don't te like send to correct you and be like, like I, I don't know what's going on. Uh, today is July 1st, where we're actually recording this. Um, we are speaking so, yeah. to you from the past. <laughs> yeah. So it's already like 19 days away and I get my second dose and yesterday I got my first haircut in four months so I'm actually feeling mm -hmm. like that things are, are, are not just thinking that I know things will get back to normal mm -hmm. but I'm starting to feel it and um I'm starting to not plan for down the road but think about mm -hmm. uh down the road which is nice and I don't know what it's like in the States. Like I know you guys, a lot of the places were opening earlier than, than we are. I don't know if, you know, if there's that same sort of feeling. I know some States like with really low vaccination rates, their cases are going back up. So maybe, I don't know, it, just here it feels like things are, are happening. It's weird out here. Cause I'd say the vast majority of folks in the state are in complete denial and are convinced that we've beat it everything's yeah. fine there wasn't really a pandemic in the first place and let's just go out and do stuff yeah uh, and India did that and and that yeah. took well for them yeah and we got delta out of that so i'm hoping we don't end up with something else but yeah yeah well <laughs> th uh, yeah i mean things i think things are going to get back to normal or a fair semblance of normal i know like um you know I, I think we may have talked about this when you were on last um throughout almost the entire pandemic um cbc news which is our, our national um news channel um would have uh american politicians come on quite a bit and be like you guys have to open up the border and it, even during like the worst of mm. uh, the pandemic um uh when you guys you know were, were like over 100 like 150,000 new cases every day stuff like that they're like oh it, it's not right you have to let americans come into canada mm. no. no as much as i'd like to visit no. my friends north of the border mm -hmm. you don't want no. us right now no. i love i love <laughs> my american friends i love oh which reminds me Anyway, I'll finish the thought. I love my American friends, but no, I'm, you're not coming here. Like, no, just no. Let's, no. 
and a story. Um, but that reminds me because uh, the week after your episode, I uh, interviewed, um, you know, Bob Freeman. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And um, uh, so we're yapping. I was telling him um, the dream I was telling you about, like after we finished recording and I'd mentioned to him that dream. And he's like, oh, you and, and Michelle need to come here. Um, and he has uh, an, uh, an odd fellows hall there in Converse that he's been um, investigating for like two decades. He's like, you guys have to come down and, and visit and I'll take you around, blah, 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 blah. And so just FYI, I'm like, well, yeah, sure, I'm down for that. But then I proceeded to be like, yeah, no, Michelle and I will do that. So apparently mm -hmm. I'm making decisions for you. So I mean, I would love to like actually meet meet Bob face to face. We've well, followed it's, some interesting parallel very, lines. Very interesting parallel lines, um, which was kind of cool. Uh, that was really highlighted because I interviewed you both back to back, but he's only a four hour drive away from you. And, um, oh, that's easy. That's easy. <laughs> yeah. And, um, he's a 13 hour drive away from me, which actually is a very, uh, that's, that's a breeze of a drive. I love long distance driving. When I lived in Texas, I'd always drive back here to Canada when I'd visit and I'd make it as far as like Duluth. Mm -hmm. So like I drive for like 26 hours straight, but I love doing stuff like that. So a 13 hour drive, that's a breeze. I leave yeah, in the morning, get there. In the to, so where yeah. my mom used to live, sorry. Yeah, so apparently the three of us are gonna do some um, ghost busting in Converse. And um, you know, he writes in his books uh, a lot about the area and he did a really great 30 days of Halloween and with some lore and, and stuff about the area. And he really is, he really brings with his writings, um, especially in his books, he really brings that area to life. And so I feel like I, I, I'm intimately familiar with it. So now I really want to go and, and visit Bob and explore that area. So um, yeah, so just, just let you know, I made the decision for, for you, so. There we go. Um, yeah, so anyways, enough about me. I'm just kidding, let's talk more about me. Um, <laughs> enough about me. So the last time you were on, uh, we were um, talking, we got up to the point where you and Elfie were in the wilds of Oregon um, with uh, a, a crew member on, uh, um, paranormal state and you guys were um reenacting the whole Oregon trail thing but you didn't need each other so that's good you guys survived mm -hmm. that no cannibalism but once um uh so we were going to pick up there for this yeah. episode but once we stopped recording you had remembered a podcast that you wanted to mention a bit about that, that you were doing or you were on or something while you were in college. There was something about Ooh. a podcast because we, we went from- Oh, you, I, I, you in okay. Oh, not in college, after college, because we went yeah. from your college days to you writing to just starting Paranormal State. And then when we ended, you're like, oh, there's podcasts. So if you want to start with that podcast Ooh. and then um, jump right into- um, where you left off in Oregon? Well, well, shortly before I started working with Paranormal State, I had started up a podcast with uh, Chris Miller, who was the one of the lead developers for Podio Books. So he was kind of like on the ground floor of podcasting in the middle 2000s. And we, we called it Shadow Dance Podcast, which was a callback to a magazine that I ran from 91 to 96. Mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> the magazine was more like gothic literary vampire adjacent. Uh, the podcast was uh, pagan pop culture and weird, uh, which these days it would have been like the best thing ever. Yeah. Uh, back then, nobody knew what a podcast was. It was still right. um, number one in its category on iTunes. So we were up there with Dio's Shadow and a couple of the other groundbreaking early pagan podcasts. Ran for a couple of years. Uh, I don't think that there are archived episodes of it online anywhere. Um, due to a death in the family, we, uh, we fumbled the website. And when it was supposed to get like re-upped, 
it didn't. And somebody was so popular, somebody parked it and was trying to like sell it back to us for like $15,000. Oh no. Uh, At which point we were like, no, no, (laughs) no. Sorry, no. So if you find shadowdancepodcast.com, that's not us anymore. Uh, But I know that it was foundational for the time. And it was interesting because like I was like, doing paranormal state stuff. I was doing uh, convention things. Uh, I had some like really neat early interviews on the podcast. So uh, Christopher Penzak, uh, a lost interview with Zuzana Budapest. Oh. Because, because my skills at the tech side of things, not so great, especially back then. Like these days, you want a podcast, you have an iPad, you're good. You have an iPhone, you're good. Back then, mm. it was a lot more equipment and a lot more fiddly. And if you didn't know Audacity or something, you were kind of screwed. Uh, i trying to think of who all else we had on there. Uh, lots of lots of neat stuff and mm-hmm. lots of neat people. Just good conversations all around. Like, like we, we just would start with a topic and kind of like see where it took us. Um, and that, I forget why that, why I was reminded of that beyond the fact that, you know, back in my day, we had a podcast before (laughs) anybody even knew what a podcast was. (laughs) I don't know, you you know, because we, we ended the episode and then we were just chit-chatting and you were like, oh, I forgot about, you know, so I don't know if it was just something that you wanted to mention or, or if it seemed like there was any sort of like special relevance tying into mm-hmm. um, the the transition from from what we were talking about before starting onto the paranormal state stuff. I think it was mo- mostly because like that time period uh, from from like two thousand two to probably twenty ten is like this interesting transition period because 2002 is when I went back on tour with my metal band. It Mm. was like a reunion uh, and that led into doing more convention work again uh, and that led into the podcast and like just all of this stuff sort of folded into everything else. Uh, Writing for the Paranormal Insider, which was the uh, the blog tie-in for Paranormal State. So I was writing that stuff with Rosemary Ellen Guiley and I think Lloyd Auerbach and some other folks uh, before I was on actually on Paranormal State. Right. Because that's the thing. Is like I, I wasn't uh, asked to be a psychic on, on the show. I was asked to be a researcher. Uh, and it was this wrong turn in Oregon where they brought me out to be Elfie's mentor. Um, to kind of, I mean, Elfie was going through some stuff. She lost her father and her brother in rapid succession. In the middle of all of this, there, she's, she's like one of a small group of friends who are all introverts, mm-hmm. who are suddenly in this like smash hit with 3.5 million viewers. And that's just the, the, the US viewership and, and like, you know, just everything is going on and like how overwhelming that is. Uh, so they wanted someone to kind of draw her out of her shell they, they, they saw her as being kind of in a shell at the time and uh chip coffee was the psychic on that case uh it, the episode is called the messenger uh it's in i think gold beach oregon and it's this uh this woman who has a house that's near to where uh, a fatal car accident had happened and she's experiencing uh, a bunch of different things and uh once we showed up, albeit very late, after this like wrong turn through the logging roads and like burned forest and just whoa, um, like like hours of wrong turns. Um, just for the record, just for the the, <laughs> the younger listeners, um, there were no uh, smartphones and GPS, Google Maps, so we did get lost back in the day. Oh, yeah, it, we, even if we had it. Uh, there was no option. So, so there was this point where, cause, cause it was me, it was the, the PA and it was chip coffee in this, in this thing. Cause like we'd shown up late there, this one had been fraught with things. Like there was a bunch of delays with people flying in, like we got in late. So what I remember is I'm sitting in the back, Chip's, Chip took shotgun, um, the other guy's driving and he's, the other guy's like trying to navigate back to where they're going from the he's picked me up at one hotel chip up at another hotel and off we go Mm. 
there's a point where he makes a turn and there is a sign. And the thing is, is it's not like, you know, a printed sign that you'd expect to find, um, you know, by the transit authority. Like it's, it's this big wooden sign and it, it sort of has a rustic look to it. And it says, warning, logging road, no cell reception, you can be stranded, you may die. Oh. Like, wow. just straight up. <laughs> and I'm like, guys? And, and I believe, Chef's re reaction was like, oh, that's got to be somebody's prank. And I'm like, that looks kind of serious. I don't know if we're supposed to be going. We went that way anyway. <laughs> you know, a sign like that, I'd be like, we're going that way. Mm -hmm. Like I can, I can, I can see the interstate this way. We're going that way. Yeah, we we, we could have gone this way, or we went where the sign said you might die. Yeah. So we went, we went there, and of course, it didn't take long before there was no cell reception. The guy driving hadn't let us know that he was an insulin dependent diabetic and hadn't brought food along, <laughs> and didn't expect to be driving for hours. Uh, we had a flat tire up on the logging road. It was a one lane rog logging road. So like we're there, there's sheer rock face, there's sheer rock face, and then there's logging trucks coming straight at us. That was fun. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> it was, it was a whole experience. Yeah. <laughs> now did, did, did you guys, you know, with all of the mishaps from like starting from like, you know, delayed flights all the way to that, were, did you guys discuss like, is this, just a series of coincidences or is, is something going on with this? this one this one was interesting because it's not like it was a demonic case it wasn't a particularly scary case it was you know some guy had rolled like like had, had crashed rolled his car uh smashed his head in in the the thing so he was kind of being seen as a headless ghost but it was just some dude like like it's not like there was there was bad stuff going on in retrospect, um, because of some things that were not related to the haunting, I actually wonder if some people's better angels uh, or spirit guides or whatever, anything that might be looking out for them, weren't trying to not so subtly say, nah, you don't want this case. Mm. No, really, it's more trouble than it's worth. No, no, really, just turn back now. Yeah. Because um, it was on the back end, it was way more trouble than it was worth. It was a lot of weird, kind of sketchy stuff on the part of the client. Like, it was just, it was weird, um, hmm. and that had nothing to do with the ghosts. Right, right. That was just people. Interesting. It almost sounds like that whole scenario, if that was all on film, would have made a better episode than the actual investigation. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I will say that in, in my life, if I'm supposed to go somewhere and there are that many obstacles tossed into my path, I will kind of stop, reassess, mm -hmm. and go, okay, am I being told something or is this just reality because sometimes shit happens? Yeah, yeah. Uh, and, and just kind of like, you know, make my judgment from there of like, well, maybe I should take this as a sign. Yeah. And wait another day. Because like literally everything that could go wrong with getting us to that location uh, multiple people it, it, it just did mm -hmm. so, so how, how did that episode was it that episode where you transitioned from researcher to, to psychic or was mm -hmm. that, okay okay yeah so so what happened was, i mean i i i i loved paranormal state it was my like i said it was my first um paranormal show i'm excluding dana's show just because you know that was a small canadian show for yeah. one season no one knows what i'm talking about yeah but but don't don't exclude dana like she's, I, mean, I don't she's, exclude it because every time yeah. i talk about paranormal state i talk about dana's show yeah. um as my first real you know but I, I you know more just for like the listeners just so because they know what we're talking about with paranormal. Yeah. State. I mean, I've literally seen every, every episode more than once. So I, I wish I can, in my head, be like, oh, I know what case you're talking about. But I, 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 I can't. It, it was a largely forgettable episode, honestly. Yeah. Um, so how I ended up doing psychic work on that episode was, so we take this wrong turn, and there's multiple times where I'm like, hey, guys, I don't think we should go this way. Hey guys, be careful. I think we're going to get a flat tire. Hey guys, we, oh, I've got a bad feeling about this. And eventually Chip was like, are you psychic? And I'm like, well, yeah. I mean, 
I, I wrote books about psychic development. He's like, why didn't you tell people that you were psychic? You know, in his very sweet, like yeah. Southern accent. I'm like, they didn't ask. You notice how I... he doesn't age. <laughs> hmm? You yeah. notice how he doesn't age. Like he looks yeah, he's, the he's same been, now that he did I, I think back in the day. Kind of like how Samson's power is in his hair, Chip's power is in his scarf. Yeah. <laughs> The Atlanta humidity helps too. Mm -hmm. uh, so, I mean, long story short was since Chip was there to do the psychic work uh, and he was like, but you're psychic too. Uh, there was sort of a, it wasn't framed as a competition. It was more, let's throw two people at this and see if we get the same results or different results. Mm. So they kept me aside outside of the house. Chip went and did his thing. People filmed him doing his thing. Um, and then when he was done, they're like, you, you willing to go? And they did the same thing with me. And the really cool thing was we hit on the same places in the house. Okay. That sounds familiar. There was a thing with a bathroom. This house was weirdly decorated. There was this enormous kitschy Egyptian sarcophagus recreation at the end of a hallway. It's like from, I, I immediately recognize it from design Toscano, uh, they, they, a bunch of different things. There was sort of like a seance -y thing at this like little low coffee table. The client was a uh, probably five foot two, five foot three blonde uh, white woman, uh, probably late thirties, early forties. I'm terrible with age. Yeah. <clears throat> but yeah, so uh, both Chip and I ended up picking up on the same hot spots in the house and broadly the same sort of uh, imprints of experiences. And from there, uh, I remember the conversation in like the little front hallway uh, of the family where, you know, they're like, so what should your, your log line or your tagline or, or something be? And I'm like, uh, and I'm like, well, what do you mean? Cause like, I, I, I've done stuff on documentaries before this, but not like what you're talking about. Uh, and they're like, well, what do you call yourself? I'm like, psychic vampire? Uh, something else. Mystic? Something else. Mm. And like, I went down a list of like, here are things that I do. And they, they chose none of them. They're like, that's too much work to explain. That's too much work to explain. And they were just like, psychic medium it is. And I'm like, yeah. I, yeah. I don't actually like the word psychic. Never mind. Yeah. <laughs> you hit the marketing machine there. Yep. Yep. Well, just like, and, and like, just, like, that, just like Elfie the Witch. Yeah, no, and, and that's the thing is like one of the things about TV is you do have to simplify, especially terms and titles yeah. for the audience. You have to you, you have to at least meet the audience halfway in what you expect the audience to have context for. Um, and I mean, I wasn't a stranger to that. I'd done uh, a documentary piece with um, Inbal Lesnar for Night Bites, Women, of their Women and Their Vampires. And it was for like, uh, we, uh, this was like 2000, something like that. Actually, it might've been a little bit later than that. It was the, it, we did a follow-up in February in LA and it sticks in my head because it was the day that the second space shuttle blew up. And it was like an all Israeli oh, crew. Okay, okay. And there was an Israeli national on, on that one. Like there was just, everything stopped yeah. for a little while because, because bad. Um, but since that one was, uh, they were asking about the allure of the vampire and like the sexual qualities of the vampire. And like, I very casually was like, blah, 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 BDSM community. And they were just like, could you, could you explain that very, could you use a different term? Like, nobody's gonna know what you're talking about. I'm like, but, but how? Yeah. Oh, that's right. Regular folk don't apparently have this as just part of their everyday language. This is before Fifty Shades of Grey. Oh wait, yeah, no, exactly. Yeah. And, and like post Fifty Shades of Grey, people would be like, oh, like Christian Grey. And I'm like, oh no. Oh no, 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 no. no. <laughs> Not even a little bit. There's yeah. actually consent, safe, sane, and consensual, and not just a whole bunch of edge lord bullshit. Anyway, <clears throat> I have opinions. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> oh, our world. I, I just, yeah, we live in a different world. We really do. We really do.
I mean, I'm used to that part. It's just, you know, like, like just some basic context. But, but yeah. anyway, so thereafter, I was a psychic medium, um, which was really funny because I had just gotten done lecturing at Slippery Rock University and went on record as saying, I don't like the word psychic and here's why. And then they were like, but you're a psychic on this show. And I'm like, I still don't like the word psychic. I think it makes everything a little too special and precious and like gives you the impression that like, only I, the bona fide psychic, can do the psychic things. Whereas, yeah. honestly, I'm like, just about everybody has these perceptions. Like, they're they're a normal, natural thing. We've just kind of shoved them in a corner, and everything about our culture has told us that they're wrong, and it's superstitious, and to believe in anything beyond uh, simultaneously a... Uh, white conservative Christian reality, but also this materialistic, uh, pseudo scientific, nothing is real beyond what you can physically touch reality. Only those two options are real. Never mind that they don't actually like really go together, but they do, they must. Yeah. And everything else is bad, rank superstition, yeah. and you should feel bad and sit in your corner and not be an animist. Yeah. Yeah. It's amazing <laughs> how something can be bad, but also not existent at the same time. Yeah. I just, yeah. 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 <laughs> but I do fall firmly in the camp of, I think that psychic abilities are things that everybody has. Mm. Um, and that like there, there's exceptions to the rule, obviously. Like I, I can no longer see like the screen, like you are a, a weird sort of thumb shaped blur without my glasses on. So not the we first, don't have- I, It's not the first time I've been called a <laughs> thumb shaped blur. <laughs> <laughs> but we don't have corrective lenses for the third eye. So there, there's going to be some people who, who don't quite have the same level of acuity or are the equivalent of blind in that sense. Mm -hmm. But they are, they are, they are the minority and they are uh, sort of a, a deviation from, from the norm. Right. Which is kind of, I mean, again, in our world, that sounds perfectly normal. But it does, you know, admittedly sound weird that... Mm. But the people that don't really have, you know, the 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 psychic abilities, like they're they're the abnormal. You know yes. what I mean? Like yeah, it, it, it does sound people, weird when yeah, you just vocalize that. They just don't think about their abilities as psychic. Like it's such mm. a normal part of everyday life. Yeah. To to walk up to someone and just have a bad feel about them and maybe avoid them for that reason. Yeah. Uh, or not be comfortable in a space. And and it's so normal, you don't think about why. Yeah. And you don't think, like, this is the reason I'm avoiding it. Like, we don't examine it. We're, we're, we're not in any way encouraged to examine it. So instead, we're just sort of reactive or sort of suppressing it, like going, well, this is a thing and I don't know what's going on. So I'm just, that makes me uncomfortable to think too hard about it. I'm just going to be over here and, you know, just ignore it. Yeah. But, but it's what we are. It's who we are. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. One of the things that I like recently is watching um, some of the different parts of my personal Venn diagram all start to converge on energy work and psychic experience and witchcraft and the occult and realize that they're all pretty much talking about the same thing, that, right. that it's just different different terms in some cases but you know to be an effective witch of course you have to have some level of psychic perception mm -hmm. and some level of energy awareness and ability to manipulate that no matter how you frame it or what language you use for it and a lot of energy work and and similar things are going to be indistinguishable from witchcraft and the yeah. way that you do spells is just going to have a different a different like outside shape to it but the mechanics are pretty similar right right absolutely <clears throat> so um so, so okay so what i'm kind of curious about is you know chip coffee he's like oh my god are you psychic blah 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 okay well let's do this test you know what what did the you know producers of of the show like were they like oh we have two psychics how great we're like let's just like how how does that you know because you're already working for the show as a researcher so so you're not new to them 
So that's probably an easier conversation. But what was like, did, were they just like, hey, be on the show as a psychic? Like, so I think part of it was, it was sort of a twofer. There was the PRS team who definitely wanted me to work with them more. Okay. And then there was the production company that needed to see me like actually like on the ground in front of the camera to go does is this person mediagenic is this person mm -hmm. because you can have a lot of people who have great expertise they're very good at what they do and you put them on a camera and they do not know how to handle themselves uh they, they just some people just it's it's not an inborn talent for most yeah. folks and so i think it was a combination of that <clears throat> Uh, Ryan was a little resistant at first because what he knew me as was that, that vampire person. <laughs> and he's like, I, I, I don't know about that. Um, Elfie and Josh Light were the ones who, to my knowledge, most uh, lobbied for me. Mm. And it was, uh, I didn't realize that it was basically my tryout or my res and, and my resume at the same time, but like that reading that we did sort of off the cuff and unplanned that was what cinched it. Mm. <clears throat> that was the okay. You're 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 good at this. You're accurate. You're decent on camera. Like, cool. Mm. And and so got rubber stamped from there. Now the other thing is, and like I don't belabor this because it's like like at what point I had been working in um, television television for quite some time at that point as a media liaison for the vampire community, the goth community, and a couple of other fringe marginalized communities. Right. I did that on my own dime. Mm -hmm. I very rarely got paid for that for any of the documentaries or radio shows or anything that I did leading up to Paranormal State, which meant that I had um, an expectation that something like this was only ever going to pay for my travel, but nothing else. Right. So it never occurred to me to ask and it never came up from the production company to do no so. Kidding. So I did my work unpaid uh, for Paranormal State until I think third season when Ryan finally caught wind of it and read them the riot act. <laughs> it was like, what, what do you mean? These people are coming on and not getting paid. Like, uh, Paranormal State had a pretty sizable budget per episode, as it turns out. Um, it's interesting. Really? That, yeah. Uh, I, I, $250,000 uh, per episode minimum. Wow. It, was, it was a good chunk of money, and they were cutting corners left and right for everything else. So, so where that money was going mm -hmm. was, I think, mainly the production company. Right. Because that's one of the things that people don't think about with reality TV is... Uh, it exists partly because it circumvents actors' guilds, yeah, screenwriters' guilds, like all of the things, all of the structure that is put into place in Hollywood to make sure that the actual talent gets paid and is supported. Mm -hmm. uh, reality TV exists to just sideline that entirely. Yeah. Uh, and so generally... Uh, the folks who make the most money off of any of those shows are the people who develop them yeah. and market them. Yeah. They're almost never the people who are on camera. It's very rarely uh, the, the the talent, the team itself. Yeah. Uh, and and it was disheartening to like, you know, sit and overhear conversations among some of the production company people as they're like kind of gleefully talking. Like one of them was developing another thing and she was talking about like how they were writing their release forms so that they could simultaneously get people to agree to do things that were dangerous and also waive all their rights to being paid for it. Like, like just basically like, like, like gleefully bragging how they were taking advantage of people. And I, you know, I've got really keen ears. So I'm just like sitting there going, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, yep, this is totally an industry that I want to keep working in. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Wow. So there was there was a lot of being taken advantage of. Um, yeah. It's also why once it came fifth season and it was a really popular show and it came time for all of us to sign new contracts, we didn't. Oh. <clears throat> and, and that is the one thing that I really appreciate about the Paranormal State team was we had solidarity that a lot of shows don't necessarily, especially if they were pulling people, you know, 
this was a group that already existed before it was a television show. Right. Uh, so these were friends. They had established relations and relationships, as we you know get to find out after the fact. So when we would be put into situations where the production company might want us to do something we didn't want to do, uh, we would we would huddle up and just wait them out. Uh, they don't like paying overtime to the crew, as it turns out. So if you just go for a long walk uh, after they've asked you to maybe like try to fake something, they will back down. <laughs> huh. Interesting. And we, we went for long walks a couple of times. But those long walks got more and more toward, toward like fourth and fifth season. There was a lot of like pressure to there, now there were all these other shows and they're like you got to get evidence you got to get evidence these other shows are getting evidence and we're like well you evidence doesn't happen just because we want it to be you need to get evidence do you understand your ratings rely on you having the ghosts do something that you capture on camera i don't care how you do that and we're like yeah that's that's not what we're about though like we're here to investigate. We're here to help the families. Mm. We're here to prove things to ourselves. We are not here to do what you're asking us to do. Right. Yeah. I mean, we I, I we all know that that goes on with you know um, uh, investigative shows, um, but still, I, I still you know when when the the topic comes up, it's like man unbelievable it's not unbelievable but it's still it's it's unbelievable what we had we had to start doing like increasingly draconian rules for where the production and crew were allowed to be because uh early on ryan caught uh one of the producers instructing crew members to whisper when we were doing EVP sessions. Oh no, I never would have thought of that. Like, yeah, well, and, and that's the thing is like- company Going behind yeah. the crew's back to do something like that. So, so don't just dog on, like you can have a completely above board team, mm -hmm. but the production company, it was a huge comeuppance for me to realize that the production company, I, I idealist that I was, was like, oh, they're doing a ghost show. It's on ghost hunting. Of course, the people who have developed this believe in this and they're out there to like try to pass this information along. And we're yeah, really trying yeah. to help people and gung ho. And no, actually they thought it was all fake. The production company, it was just a shtick. They assumed that we were all either faking or deluded. They, they spent so much time trying to figure out what the fuck I was actually doing because they weren't feeding me stuff. They were trying to figure out who was feeding me stuff because they simply couldn't believe that somebody was psychic. Like they didn't think it was real. It couldn't be real. They, they wanted it to look good on camera, mm -hmm. um, but it, it was, it was eye-opening. <laughs> yeah. And you know, a big lesson that while I love the conversation that these television shows inspire, Mm -hmm. that it puts things out where the audience and, and folks who are, who are actual investigators can raise questions and explore stuff. And we can, you know, occasionally bring in new ideas like egregores and the fifth experiment and kind of like, like start a dialogue. Mm -hmm. It's all still television. Yeah. And everybody has to keep in mind, like it's going to be made for entertainment, no matter the, the idealism behind it. Yeah. So there are, going to be like jump scares and cut scenes like like the their, their favorite thing for paranormal state was like somebody would like you know somebody would fart and be like oh, like that and you we, we would joke we're like oh yep that's going to be the cut to the commercial break they won't explain why somebody just jumped yeah <laughs> but yeah. that's going to be that's going to be it oh yeah. <gasps> what are we looking at Sergi tripped. That's what we're looking at. Yeah, which is fine because as a viewer, that's what I want. I want that. Oh, I want the jump scare, and I want the 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 suspense of um, you know, cut, go to commercial. I want to know what's going on. And usually, nine times out of ten, when the show returns after commercial, it's pretty much a letdown. Yeah. But every Sometimes time that happens, every single show every single episode and they do that i'm like ooh, what's gonna you know and i know damn well it's gonna be nothing but 
but but the thing is that um, this is because I'm not a paranormal investigator. I see these shows. Um, uh, at, they're they're my entertainment. Like I'm I'm watching because I want to be entertained. I would like to see some actual evidence, of course. Um, but but I'm watching these, you know, to be entertained. So you know, give me that cutscene. Give me that jump scare. Absolutely. I know, you know that. Oh, what just happened is going to be not as dramatic after the commercial, but. I still fall for it every time because I just want to be entertained, you know? So there's nothing wrong with that. Um, I don't even think, you know, I, I don't even think, oh, I, I, I don't know if I'm going to be able to say this right. Mm -hmm. I don't think it's right to include fake evidence. No, I, I, I agree. I, I fall hard on that. Yeah. And However, I love working with Katrina. Uh, I love her. I love her to pieces because in her contracts for anything, especially after our experience with Paranormal State, it is like written into her contract. If there's any point where she catches faking, if she's asked, if she's just out yeah. with, with, with a payoff clause. Like just, yeah. nope. Yeah. Hard no. Because yeah. <clears throat> yeah. I, you know, I, I don't want to see or hear fake evidence. Um, however, if, there's going to be fake evidence. Like I, I would want the the team to do it, not the producers behind their back. You know what yeah. I mean? Um, yeah. Because <laughs> because I know where where you stand as a team, and I know how to judge you as a form of entertainment. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, the idea and that thought never ever occurred to me that the production company would actually go behind the team's back, you know, mm -hmm. to, to try and fabricate evidence. Um, that is, that is just abhorrent to me. Yeah. Yeah. That's the thing. Now, now the thing that always like Josh Light and I would talk about this because it, it baffled us. There were a few times where we got evidence that we we're like, we cannot explain this. This is a, a few times where it's like, what the, just how, what, like, what was that? Mm -hmm. And weirdly they would opt not to put that in the episode. Like there's a couple of things that were like, but, but why? And and partly because <clears throat> the production company was still approaching it like, sort of, even though it was a scripted TV show, they went in with their idea of like what this haunting was supposed to be like. Right. So they they kind of like cast us as characters. I mean, I was like like literally, it's very obvious if you think about Buffy mm -hmm. and the Scooby yeah. Gang, and you look at the Paranormal State. They, they pretty much were like, we can see that it's it's the Scooby gang. They're just missing yeah. Giles. And then I was just like, hi. Yeah. <laughs> Here's Giles with Spike's fashion sense. Yeah. Um, and, and they were very much thinking of it like that. So when they would get to the point of editing the thing together, they, the production company, had an idea of like what the haunting really was. Uh, and, and another comeuppance was like, they wanted us to live tweet. That's why I have a Twitter account. Mm. Um, and... You know, we, we were discouraged from talking about stuff leading up to the airing of the episode. So, like, there were things that we couldn't talk about. Right. But I also learned to not do that for a very salient reason, which was there were a couple of episodes that what aired is not what we felt the haunting really was. Right, right, right. And right. so, like, they edited it in a certain way to kind of, like, spin it a certain way. And we were like... That's that wasn't our resolution at all. That wasn't yeah. our assessment at all. Yeah. In, in one case, I, I can kind of see it. Like it was, there was a concern about um, legal and sort of like how it would come across because there's a high likelihood that uh, the client was just going through menopause and misunderstanding a lot of what her symptoms were. Right. And we we were pretty direct about that. <laughs> so. Uh, there was another one where it came up that a client had had an abortion and literally had not told her family. Uh, the family found out about it because it's part of my psych reading. Um, so that was a very awkward thing to have happen on camera. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, 
And the question was like, was guilt around this part of the manifestation of what was going on in this particular location? You will see none of that come up in any episode. I won't even tell you which one it was. Right, yeah. Um, because for, for so many reasons. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, so there's definitely stuff that wouldn't make it, but, but um, I wasn't there for this one. It was one of the I am six uh, ones with the, the, the girl and the, the demonic stuff. Uh, or, or certainly what she was experiencing as demonic. And Josh described this, this thing where he was very skeptical um, that what she was experiencing was more psychosomatic. Uh, and given her, her, her health history, sort of like the fact that she was normal and then had this onset of a chronic illness and suddenly was now a, a shut-in, like he was like, honestly was like, it's either familial stuff going on or she's you know but you know they had cameras because some of her reports were things assaulting her in her sleep right they had cameras on her in her bed and there's a point where he's like we've we've got it on camera it's in the files something like there's she, she's lying there she's a skinny emaciated figure there's just like a thin sheet over her and like the uh ruffles and whatnot in the sheet and something near her foot just sort of like bumps up and something moves under the sheets up her thigh. <laughs> and, and Josh is just like, <laughs> like, yeah. like some stuff and you're just like, okay. So, so one, holy crap. Mm -hmm. Two, what even is going on there? Um, and, and three never makes it to the episode. How strange, right? I, it, maybe because of the implied sexual assault part of it, because that's pretty much what we, like, Lee was that that was her her assessment was she asserted that something was assaulting her sexually in her sleep. Right, right. Um, but. Huh. To, to, to not even reference that like and then there were multiple instances of like something that was just like whoa hmm. here's this thing that happens and what you're gonna fixate on is uh somebody catching a deer in the woods with a FLIR camera only not being sure that it's a deer oh god that's the jersey devil no not really guys that's a deer yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> wow it's yeah it you know um Television really is a whole other world. It really is. It, it, it just, you know, it, I, I don't think anyone can think that television, Hollywood, and any of that just makes any sort of sense. Unless, unless like you're 100%, like you're, you're, you're all in, you know what I mean? Um, it's yeah. you know, like, like my work as a makeup artist, it, it's just, it's a whole other, um, uh, Back in the day, I should say, uh, working as a makeup artist. It's just a whole other bizarre world. It really is. Yeah, it's, it's so much of it just doesn't make any sense. It well, I mean, it's it's kind of a, an echo chamber. Like it it makes sense within mm -hmm. its own little thing, or at least it's it's so insular that it thinks it makes sense. And then yeah. if you step outside of that, you're like, but why are we doing it like this? This yeah. doesn't like this is not the most efficient way of doing it. Like we're doing it just because this is the way we've always done it. Like, who yeah. even came up with this, guys? Yeah, yeah. You know, one thing, and you had mentioned um, in episode one, you, you you know, said it again uh, a few minutes ago, but you did mention this um, about how it's almost like they they portrayed, like they, they looked at the the Scooby gang and, and, and Buffy and like, okay, we can, you know, create that with this team. And that is one thing about that show. I find that all the team members are very one-dimensional, mm. which they're not because, well, they're just not. Um, number two, they're they're human, so they're certainly not one-dimensional. Um, but they, but everyone appears very one-dimensional. Like X person is always like this. Y person is always like this. Like there's not a lot of variation in in um, in personality and 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 whatnot. So you can see that mm -hmm. sort of um, that 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 concept, that mindset. Like oh, we can create, you know, um, this this kind of 
Buffy-esque or Scooby-esque group with this team and yeah and 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 they really they would people were very different on camera and how they would get portrayed was the production company definitely putting them in a box yeah so like josh light who was the tech guy engineer brilliant fellow um will like talk your ear off with an explanation of like what's going on and tends to debunk things what you never get to see is he's also pagan Mm -hmm. He's also yeah. a, a practitioner of magic. So he is simultaneously a, a skeptic with an engineering background who also practices magic, is capable of navigating those two mindsets. So when he debunks things, he's debunking it from the heart because he's like, this doesn't make any magical sense either. And, and also he was sensitive. Like, yeah. But people weren't allowed to be more than just the label that they were given. Right. Yeah. 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 And Lord, they had no idea what to do with Elfie. <laughs> Wiccan. Our little Wiccan. Because, because Willow was a Wiccan is pretty much it. Yeah. <clears throat> oh, that's right. I don't even think, they didn't even call her a witch, did they? It was Wiccan. Nope. She yeah, was Wiccan. That's right. That's right. Yeah. Um, and, and the great irony is she is a Thelemite. <laughs> like, not even, like, like so not so far from any of that yeah 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 but you know that also too that well first of all if they you know wrote you know on the screen elfie thelemite i mean not how many of you I mean, like people had enough trouble with her name yeah 99.9 percent of the viewers be like i don't know what a thelemite is um but you know it the show wasn't that long ago but the way attitudes are and the way attitudes have changed, it was that long ago. Yeah. You know? Yeah, no, so, a lot of things have changed. Yeah. So, you know, I it, it's really no surprise, you know, like where like a, a production company wouldn't want any sort of Crowley reference. Mm-hmm. And you know? and that's the thing is like her her dad was pretty much one student removed from Crowley and nobody wanted to touch that. Yeah, yeah. So <laughs> in in a way that makes sense. But to go from Thelemite to Wiccan, even for marketing purposes, um, is you know that's a bit much. But yeah, you know that's 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 the magic of television. You can go from Thelemite to Wiccan in a snap of a finger. But I mean, so much was like whitewashed and straight washed and everything washed. I mean, because I I remember the point where like we're on a, on a like little retreat and I go over to like pick up Ryan and Serge and somebody's like, oh, well, they're in the shower. And I'm like, isn't there just one shower? Oh, that explains a lot. Okay. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, this is juicy. I like this. All righty. Okay. Where where that that was always a thing, but yeah. never on camera. They were yeah. just good buds. Yeah. 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 Just like all the old fo- all the old photographs of of the the very good friends and Yep. Yeah. Yeah, very good friends. Yeah. Who yeah. sometimes shower together. Yeah. Yeah. The two confirmed bachelors that live together because it's you know it's economic and mm-hmm. all mm-hmm. that kind of stuff yeah 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 that show was so queer <laughs> like, that, so, so queer. that show is queerer than queerest folk and rupaul's drag race all put together like let's mm-hmm. be honest you know I mean, between, like ryan sergey me chip a couple of other people i'm not sure around um <laughs> Pretty sure Katrina's straight. <laughs> yeah, I well, you know, I mean, you know, we'll give her that. She is married, so yeah. technically we'll, we'll give her that. Yeah, I, I and I apparently, one way or the other. Apparently, She's still fabulous, sense. though, like yeah. so fabulous. Yeah, so, I mean, Katrina, we don't hold your, your straightness against you. <laughs> we know you can't help it, you were born that way. Um, but apparently I make decisions for people on my podcast. So yeah, I'm just deciding, yeah, she's straight. We'll just we'll give her that. You know. You I got think she's have, fa- fabulous by association. Yeah, you gotta have some straight people in the world. I mean, you know, 
you got to make them feel like they're they're special and loved. I mean, yeah. nobody nobody can can beat Katrina's like eyeshadow game though. Like like so, I mean, we would be on set for eight. She really 12, is fierce though. I mean, let's be honest, she, she's so gorgeous, and her makeup is always always on point. Yes, yeah, always. Seriously. On point. You're like, in. I, I, you've been in like a dungeon for twelve hours, and yeah, and you had to just like make up your face, and, and there's no yeah. chance where you're touching that shit up. Like you're just like this is how you look, and you better yeah. just be ready to be on camera for the next twelve hours. Yeah, yeah, <clears throat> yeah. She's always on point. She's fantastic. I like watching her how she really bloomed and or blossomed, whatever you know. Uh, from you know, you look back at paranormal state to um mm -hmm. uh, portals to hell and just uh seeing her come into her own and i mean because i don't know what how other people's impression of portals to hell is i don't know if people think it's it's more like jack osborne's show because he's the famous guy that the son of ozzy osborne but like katrina on camera like katrina's running the show you know what Jack, I mean? Jack has the grace. He defers to Katrina's expertise. Like that's the thing is Jack yeah. was curious and didn't have a lot of background on it and wanted to learn, like wanted to explore stuff and is this. So I, I'd never watch, I, I don't, I don't watch much TV. So like I knew that there was an Osborne show and I knew they had two, like there were two kids on it. Like I didn't, I didn't even realize that that was the Jack that I was working for when Katrina was like, hey, <laughs> I've got a friend. We're doing a new thing. Do you want to come on? Like, you know, you're one of the few psychics I trust. And I'm like, sure. She's like, yeah, my, my buddy Jack. And like, I didn't even hear his last name until like the third episode I filmed with them. Oh my so God. it was just like this sort of roly poly. He reminded me of Samwise Gamgee, a hobbit, mm -hmm. like just mm -hmm. like friendly, hugging, just jovial fellow. And I was like, I can't quite place the accent but cool, seems like a nice guy. Yeah. Um, and then I was like, oh, oh, still a nice guy. Way nicer yeah. than I would have expected from, wow. Oh, oh, that makes so much sense. Because the one thing that I had noticed was um, he clearly, before knowing who he was, uh, he clearly had a lot of pull in the background. And I could see immediately why Katrina liked this show, especially coming from what, what we went through with Paranormal State was, the production company, no shenanigans. Everybody knew exactly like what they what their limits were, what their boundaries were. Um, mm. We didn't pretend that the production company wasn't there. So if they had an experience, they went on camera too. Yeah. Everybody had to be prepared for that. Uh, and whenever I put in a request of like, okay, this is how I work as a psychic. And I when I say I want no one to tell me anything, I don't mean slip me information and I'm only saying that on camera. I mean, tell me nothing. Right, right. And if it's possible, put me up in a hotel, like one state line, over, like, like I want to be as in the dark as possible mm -hmm. um, and, and manage that as, as well as you can. Keep me away from people having conversations. I've got good ears and I don't want to know. Mm. And once Jack heard all of that, he was like, okay, got it. And just trusted that that was my process. Katrina backed me up and they've just let me do whatever I need to do to be a, a, as accurate, but also to trust what I'm picking up. Right. As psychic, as opposed to, I do have really good ears. I do have a pretty like uh, Sherlock Holmesian sort of intuitive read for things. I've got a psych background. Like it's yeah. really easy to come up with a lot of stuff and just let it be extrapolation yeah. as opposed to what I want is what are these psychic abilities? Like what can I pick up from a location with no other information? Like what are the limits? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so for me, it's a, I, I get a chance to experiment and I, I love the fact that Jack uses his clout to make sure that there are no shenanigans behind scene. Right, right. But yeah, but, but I mean, you know, like as a team, like like you know, she's in charge, you know, and mm. and uh, that's nice to see because you know, uh, white men, that's like their their default position. Like you know, this I, I'm in charge. This is I how it's raised, you know. And um, it's just, it's nice to see that that's not how 
you know, that's not how it, it works. Um, but also, like I said, like, like reflecting back to paranormal state, it, it's nice to see that, you know, how, how Katrina has, has evolved and it, it's just, it's a nice, I, I love watching her on, on Portis to Hell because she's just, she's, she's, um, she's come into her own and, you know, she's a strong woman doing her thing. And I think well, it's fantastic. The thing about the entertainment industry and television, especially, if you do not very quickly get a handle on setting your boundaries, making no, you basically you 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 don't take mm -hmm. well, what if for an answer, <clears throat> especially if you are a female identified female presenting person, mm -hmm. you need to be very clear. Uh, you need to take no crap. You need to not let people push you around because they will try. Yeah. Um, and you need to you need to advocate for yourself yeah. um, loudly and without apology. And Katrina is that hands down. Yeah. She she knows she knows how to do that. She knows she has to fight for herself. She's not afraid to do it. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and she's got a really good partner in Jack who will also advocate for her. And I, yeah. I will hazard to say that anybody who was raised by Sharon Osborne, yeah, no, who, who also had to survive in an industry that is incredibly toxic, yeah, yeah, that you know, yeah. Well, that's the thing too. I mean, being raised by by Sharon Osborne and having two sisters, like. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it, it's such a, a female-centric uh, family because it's three against two. Um, and all of his kids are daughters. <laughs> yeah, you know, um, so it, it in that sense, it kind of doesn't surprise me that, you know, the way, the way Jack, you know, um, kind of defers to, to uh, Katrina. It's just, like I said, it's just nice to see because it could have just yeah. been horribly different you yeah. know um it, and you know and as as great as the investigations could be it, it you know it just would be a very different show and you know so much more uncomfortable to to watch yeah. well and you know having worked in at least two instances where showrunners are at different stages of their addiction journey Mm. Mad props to yeah. Jack for having his shit together, for being honest about it, yeah. uh, and just for for turning himself around and like like becoming this really genuinely likable and insightful person, incredibly yeah. compassionate, yeah, and just super supportive. Like like, and he does not hide uh, from from anything that he's been through or the bad choices that he made. He took them as teachable moments mm -hmm. and. Not everybody does that. No, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, he just seems like uh, like just one of those genuinely good people. Like he was just, he was born that way. He was raised that way. Like everything in his life pointed in that direction of just being a genuinely genuinely good person. You know. Yeah, which, people anybody smack talks him, I I, I will throw down cuz he's he's a good guy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which, you know, is always, which is, it's kind of sad when we're always so surprised, like, oh my God, like he's genuinely a, a, a great guy because that's, you know, the exception that seems to be the exception to the rule when it comes to, you know, television and Hollywood and all that crap, you know? Privilege poisons a lot of people. Of course. Absolutely. And, they, and they don't really... They don't really recover from it. They don't really step back and, and question. Yeah. And the ones who do are, I, I like the ones that, that change, look at the world differently and use their powers for good. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. It makes for a good show. I, you know, like it's just like it, it everything just converged, I think, um, in just the right ways to, uh, to make that a really, really good show you know, all round. So, you know, kudos to everyone. That's, that's a part of that. Absolutely. Yeah. And then watching everybody try to adapt to COVID too, because that was, that was a lot. Mm -hmm. um, 
and, and just changing like how people traveled and who was comfortable with, with stuff. Like I was not on the last season a whole lot because I had some very hard limits for what yep. I was willing to do. Mm-hmm. And, and the one thing that was a, a definite no was I am not flying. Like I will not get into a plane <laughs> in the middle uh, yeah. of a pandemic. I'm sorry. Yeah. Like I get sick when there isn't a pandemic and I have to go to an airport and fly. Like I just, I catch stuff easily. So let's not play with COVID at all. Yeah, exactly. Um, exactly. And, um, they, and they were cool about that. Like, yeah. And, and, and it wasn't like a deal breaker. No, we're never working with you again. They, they, they were like, Hey, this one's close enough. We can, we can make that work. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, I'm trying to, you and I literally tweeted back and forth the entire hour. I can't remember the hotel's name. Uh, it was one episode the hotel that had the deer jump out mm. in front of them as they were driving. Tom's uh, house. That's it. Yeah. That was such, that was one of my favorite episodes. I don't get creeped out a lot on these shows. Um, that show creeped me out a bit. And because you and I were tweeting back and forth about what was going on you're like okay what what where are you now and I'm like oh this just happened and you're like oh did they show you this and I'm like no you're like oh my god that was like the best part you know because there was the church across the street and and yeah really funky stuff was going on there oh, that was that was intense yeah that was a good episode because I I got creeped out that that creature that you or spirit, whatever, that you got a name from. And you remember we were texting and someone chimed in and he's like, oh, there's, um, I think it was East European um, creature and it's called blah, blah, blah. And it was like maybe one letter different. And I Googled it and I sent you the photo, mm-hmm. or I shouldn't mm-hmm. say photo because it's a creature but- drawing. And it looked like, like, a deer yeah. with antlers, but only standing on two legs. And that was the episode that the deer jumped in front of their vehicle, their SUV, as they were coming up to the um, the hotel, which made sense because you said something on Twitter to me like, or was it a deer? You know, just kind of jokingly. And then this guy eventually chimes in with this creature that was kind of like deer-ish antlers whatever but on high you know two legs and whatnot but that was a really good episode that's one of the episodes that really sticks out to me because I just got chilled when you were um when you were getting this creature and I I don't know why because like I said these these shows generally don't freak me out you know there there's a couple um that I'm just like okay this is just I'm, I'm I'm creeped out i but that's pretty rare. And that was one of them. That was like, we had already decided, okay, I guess we're done. Um, And let's, I I think I'm done with the, with the psychic thing. Um, And one of the reasons that I'm not like uh, blindfolded for that was initially because I had been to Thomas house with paranormal state before Mm -hmm. I was brought down ostensibly uh, for my experience uh, on on cults and identifying cult like stuff, because there, there there's a whole cult aspect to people that were in that property at uh, in the in the eighties, mm-hmm. uh, and so they wanted that. But of course, if I'm on thing, they're just like, well, could we just have you also do this just to see what happens while you're here? And I was like, oh okay, because Katrina was like, so because she had been down there with me, she's like. I know where you were when you did the reading. Um, Where else on the property had you been? And I'm like, Thomas House? Like, there's like a couple of sheds behind Thomas House, but like, just just the hotel. And she's like, great. We're going to go somewhere else in town. I'm like, cool. All right. Let's saddle up. Uh, But I I never, okay, I can't say that I never get names. Mm. Uh, I should say that the circumstances under which I get names from spirits tend to be more um, ritualized or part of my personal practice. Right. Much less frequently just walking into a building and trying to communicate with, you know, Joe Average spirit. Mm -hmm. Uh, So I was as shocked as anybody where I was like, 
oh no i think it's trying to talk to me hang, hang on hang on give, give, give me give me I, paper because I, I think you kind of really were uh, I'm, I'm sure in that episode you were like this normally doesn't happen like with the mm-hmm. names i think yeah yeah, yeah. I, I i made an i made an effort to be like no this is this is atypical like but mm-hmm. but i'm getting this i don't know if this is i think this is its name this is important let me try to sound it out it doesn't sound like english at all i don't know uh it it felt like something that didn't normally speak or even think in english was trying to convey something awkwardly like it was it was i i wish i wish i could put a camera in my brain so like the audience could experience the way i experience it because there's words do not do the experiences justice Mm -hmm. No, absolutely. I mean, my God. Yeah. Yeah, because because to say that like something's talking to me is not only is there like the sense of this word taking shape in my head, but there's also the feel of the presence that's conveying it. And part of that feel. Hi, everyone. Thank you for listening to The Lux Files. I'm not just the host of this podcast. I'm also the owner of Lay Logan's Owen. I make beeswax and scented spell candles, loose stick and liquid incense, anointing rolls and bath salts. So once you're done listening to this episode, why don't you head on over to my website at www.laylokenzawin.com and check out my products. For your convenience, the link to the website is also in the show notes. Are like little blips and layers of impressions of images. And Mm. some of that is like things it's associated with. And some of it might be the way it looks. And some of it might be memories it's tied to. And it's like all, none of it's linear. It's sort of like this big neural net of associative experience that I then have to try to like, put into words yeah yeah (laughs) the hardest part of my job yeah that's why i i I think like people don't understand i um i i'm not saying this i i I, oh i don't know if that's right i was gonna say i'm not saying this from experience because i don't go around you know like okay what psychic impression do i pick up you know i in that sort of circumstance it's completely accidental um, but with ritual work and, and stuff like that, you know, um, you, you know, you're invoking whatever, I don't mean whatever, but you know, whatever yeah. it is that you're, you're working with and, um, you know, you, you try to put that experience into words and it, it's so difficult. It's, you know, when you're interacting with, I would, you know, I'm going to say interacting because it's hard to even say speaking with, mm-hmm. yeah, yeah like interacting with a spirit. Because um, it's like you're hearing, but you're not hearing. It's not yeah. with your ears, and you're seeing, but you're not seeing because it's not exactly like it, it's this weird. The next closest thing is hearing yeah. insight. It's it's complicated. Yeah, it re- reminds me in um, uh, Paul, Dr. Paul Natupski's mysticism class, part of my my college stuff the ineffability of mystical experience, just sort of like this universal truth that our most intense communications with the spirit realm and the divine elude language, Mm -hmm. like, like elude description, because they are so outside of our ordinary experience that we don't have a framework so we're struggling to try to put them into anything that we can articulate which is how like saint Teresa of avila is like you know ends up kind of rapturously talking about god as like this orgasmic lover and like everybody you know it's flame it's fire it's this it's that but it's it's just ecstasis it's being above and beyond and outside of physical uh, what we are accustomed to Mm-hmm. with our everyday physical existence yeah i've been uh doing some work with uh knocking angels um lately and that's been a whole different experience i, I once watched oh yeah yeah sorry you, you, no, I, no, I, no, I, no i've got a, i've got a fun story about okay that. uh because 
there well the first thing that i did was try to get colors for a sigil what color mm -hmm. it's supposed to be and the way the colors were presented was at first it took a while at first was absolutely not helpful at all but you also get the impression that the angels are like like i just told you answer like it's it's right there in front of you which it mm -hmm. was but how they're communicating it and how i can receive it you know doesn't match but um they're different they're they're different from any, mm -hmm. any um any other spirit form angelic form in a lot of ways um that that i've ever ever experienced um i find nicer and a lot more helpful uh easier to you know mm. work with uh in that sense but the um you know it's it, it's like two different uh pieces of of hardware or software or whatever that that doesn't um oh god i'm i'm i i, I i'm trying to do a, a technical <laughs> analogy and uh, that's not my thing um the ineffability incompatible, is incompatible, incompatible yeah. technology and um it's just it's weird it's just so, weird my favorite story about uh Inakian work was i was at i was at a convention where one of the other guests of honor was lon milo duquette mm -hmm. and he was doing a thing doing the Inakian calls calling down angels and it was a pagan convention that you know has a, a fairly diverse audience and a bunch of people saw angel um and were just like oh and they were thinking like you know nice fluffy kind of you know love and hugs and puppy dogs and rainbow angels so they went in there and lon milo duquette who at one point quoted to me that like it's fine to have enemies and the best solution is to outlive them and and like that that that's like he's he's i don't know satanic santa claus yeah <laughs> like he's not satanic just just like very he looks like santa claus he is all fucking business yeah yeah he's in there he starts intoning stuff and doing it and the vast majority of people who are like oh this will be kind of neat ran yeah. like he pulls down something so genuine no one was expecting to have this presence in the yeah. room um, and, and I think in some respects, because there's definitely people who are like, oh, I do angel, angel magic, blah, yeah. blah, blah. And it's just sort of like, these are no, no, use angels. Yeah. First of all, this is, this is not going to be like, oh, I'm love and light. And I love it. First of all, let me explain. That's not angels anyway. If, if you've yeah. got something that's all like puppy dogs and sunshine and just wants to give you a hug, that's not an angel. Yeah. You have to say, be not afraid for a fucking reason. <laughs> like don't run no really i'm i'm not here to hurt you yeah like, these are powerful alien intelligences and wow it was just watching this this exodus from this ballroom that's funny <laughs> and then people just this stunned expression of like what yeah. what just happened <laughs> yeah i'm like y'all y'all should probably go back in there and let him close that stuff down because i'm not sure that you're gonna sleep well tonight if you don't yeah. no. Yeah, no kidding i you know it's interesting because you know, angels aren't love and light. Um, read the Bible. Just read the Bible. Um, but the thing, the the thing that I, I found with the Anakian angels is they're they're all they they seem that they're all willing to mm. help you because you know you approach them properly. I, I don't mean properly, like ritually properly, but like yeah, properly, but like like don't be an asshole you know they, they, you know don't think this is the goisha where you're you're threatening them and and you know what i mean to to, yeah. to threaten them do what i want or else i'm gonna do this to you um although speaking as someone who does a fair amount of work with the goisha i have found you get a lot more if you're just like hey bro let's figure out some way where i scratch your back you scratch mine and we work together what, what yeah. would you like yeah uh, i i found that being polite and and just making it transactional and respectful yeah. you get a lot further with pretty much everything 
Yeah. Even to demons. I mean, okay. You know, so if like, you know, like help me out here. And if the demon's like, no, like, all right, I'll find another one that, that will then, I guess, you know what I mean? Like, mm -hmm. I, you know, and I'm, I'm not doing the whole witch talk thing where I'm, I'm saying abuse to, to, to demons is the same as, as actual domestic violence. That's, that's a thing now on, on witch talk. Um, but like, I, why, like, I, why, why spend the energy? No. Okay. Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. Oh, I, oh no, no. Wait, like, like sorry. Sorry. every I, week I there's totally something new that. that comes out of the witch talk community. Yeah, and I'm like, sorry. you know, I totally glossed over that for you. Sorry. Yeah. So apparently, uh, okay. apparently commanding and compelling demons is the same as beating your wife. Like there's no there's no difference um, i mean they're they're equally they're equally bad things the, the um, only thing i'm going to, to to say on that is i do think that it's healthier to ask something nicely first yeah, yeah. rather than just let's bind things I, i've always been against binding spirits though yeah. um i mean i will do it in a pinch and I, I, I will not hesitate to do it if something is being problematic and especially yeah. if it is preying on the vulnerable like i yeah. have a hard limit for that yeah, but but that's a big difference than you know binding and compelling a demon because yeah. it's not doing what you want to do. If it if it's but, if you come across someone who's having a problem with a demon, you're you're helping. Yeah, but I mean, last week everything was oh everything was a closed practice last week. Uh, it just I I I. Can't, Oh, it, it's too okay. So, so which which talk which talk at this point feels like those five a.m. conversations that we had around a bag of Doritos and a case of Mountain Dew when we were like 18, 19, 20 and didn't know like crap from crap, and just everybody had like the wildest opinions because yeah. we read really terrible books like yeah. and, and didn't have access to anything better and i think the only thing that annoys me about it now is you've got so much information mm -hmm. so much yeah and I, I realize that there's the daunting task is to identify what's the good information from the bad information but holy moly oh yeah, they're they're too much so so you know, no tarot because only the the uh, Roma can can um, use tarot because that's not culturally offensive. Um, and and binding somebody should talk to the Italians. I know, right? And binding demons is the same as domestic violence. So um, yeah, have fun with that. Yeah. Sure. I just couldn't be okay. bothered, honestly. I you know I I don't work with demons. Um, I just, I've always found, you know, going higher um, just works better for me. That's just m my thing. Um, but like even a demon that technically doesn't do X, um, I can probably get to do X if we come to the right terms. Mm -hmm. I just, I, I can't be bothered. Like, you know, I always, you know, magically always try to find sort of like a, like a mundane, re like analog. Like I'm not, yeah. to, if, if a friend of mine doesn't want to do X, I'm not going to cajole, 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 like yeah. steal um, and, and blackmail to get them to do X. But like, okay, fine. I'll, I'll find someone else to rob a bank with me. Like whatever. I was, I was just thinking like the Goetia is sort of like the pot smoking of the occult community where like pretty much everyone has probably tried it once or at least been around someone who was doing yeah, it. Yeah. Whether they want to admit it or not. Yeah. Yeah. You know, <laughs> like, so like it's, it's forbidden fruit. So everybody got curious at some point in, in their process. And, but you know, you know, I summoned, I summoned Marvis once, but I didn't actually like ask him to do anything like it didn't actually fail <laughs> yeah exactly so you know like if if i can't be bothered to you know talk a friend into doing something they don't want to do why would i you know yeah spend that kind of energy doing it to a demon or an angel or anything you know what i mean that's just not you know that's just not my way so 
I can't be bothered. But apparently for the people that can be bothered doing stuff like that, apparently they're no better than, than um, domestic violence like abusers it's really disgusting because i mean you're you're just you're completely minimizing domestic violence by making yeah. that statement just like you're yeah. being culturally insensitive uh to roma when you're saying only they can use tarot because the the gypsy tarot reader is a culturally offensive stereotype that never existed and you know what i mean like it's like this, this, this performative allyship is just, it, it, it goes from, from eye rolling to just disgusting and pathetic. How many of the ones going on about the Roma thing are white kids? Uh, 100%. Because no, no Roma, no Roma. There's better places no, for that energy no to go. Roma says, oh yeah, we invented tarot. You can't use it. You know what I mean? Um, yeah, so for anyone who's listening to this, here the tip. <laughs> if you want to know if something really is a close practice or is culturally insensitive, if you're hearing it from a white person, I'm not they're lying or they're wrong. I will check their sources, just go to the source and find out if it's true because. I it, tarot goes to like it's it's from freaking Italy. It was yeah. a it was a card game. Like they're called trumps because they were literally trumps. Yeah. Ah. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, you know, it, 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 all anytime you hear a white person talk about cultural like something is culturally appropriative or a close practice or whatever, verify it. I mean, like, honestly, like, anytime you get a white, per anytime you're a white person trying to be an expert on something that is not their thing, yeah. and telling you that, well, this this minority wants you to do this. First of all, it's not not our place to say that. Yeah. Second of all, go go talk to the person whose stuff it actually is and find yeah. out how do they feel. Exactly. Like, actually, go talk to them. Like, we shouldn't be taking up space for that. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean. Like a, a thirty-second Google search on tarot will get you the information that it was <clears throat> created in Italy. You know what I mean? It, and it, 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 yeah, you no, know, it's totally mind-boggling. But you know what? We, oh, yeah, we, but, we can we can be like, get off my lawn. I yeah, <laughs> yeah. I've been doing this for fifty years. <laughs> yeah, right. whatever. Yeah. <laughs> that's you know that's that's the thing like that doesn't sound as exciting as as you know uh, a 30 second tiktok video condemning yeah. i mean you know on the other hand i mean i kind of feel bad because i mean i, I feel bad for them in, in this sense there was definitely a point where i was more fervent than i was informed and if i had the internet and like just could just go and sound off on a video that now is out there for everybody in perpetuity. Uh, Lordy, that would have been really embarrassing. It's bad enough, like there's, I, I'm thinking specifically of an article I wrote on necromancy and the sources were so scarce and second and third hand that mm. it's just, it's just wrong. Right. And, you know, fortunately it was only like published in some tiny little thing that's so out of print that I don't think anybody's ever going to find it. So I'm not going to have somebody like pull this thing, this 30 year old article up and go like, well, back in this day, you said that necromancy was a dish and you know, hey, you're wrong. Well, I, well yes, yes, I was because yeah. the books I went, read were wrong. Yeah. And that's what happens if you are actually learning things is sometimes you're wrong. And if you are a good practitioner, you then check your sources and you expand your sources and you talk to more people and you revise your opinion yeah and yeah. this is how we grow <laughs> exactly exactly but to have that stuff out where like I, I really wouldn't like it would look very bad if like my awkward phase was just out there for everybody to see oh. like I don't think oh I'm just, so no. thankful I'm so thankful that uh the internet the way it is now with with like the ease of the internet and the access like with the smartphones and 
smartphone cameras and I'm so glad none of that existed when I was a teenager in in, in my 20s like we had to develop film like go to the store and develop the mm -hmm. film so that's I'm sure has saved me a lot of um awkward conversations mm -hmm. um yeah. so yeah I I I don't uh, I don't look at you know um millennials and 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 I, I think they're called gen z the ones after more, yeah um with any sort of uh oh you're so lucky to have all this technology because when i was your age we had you know uh, I'm like, on one hand it's cool right. and on the other hand you're gonna hate right. it in 10 years <laughs> like, yeah yeah it. you know um i i don't i don't i don't uh yeah I, I I'm quite happy with with uh, our our techless uh, teens and twenties. Absolutely, absolutely. It's bad enough that I think that you can still Google me and find like some photos from like 1996. There's there was a, a dead poet society reading poetry reading that I did, and they took the picture after I had just lugged this trunk full of all my merchandise from the parking lot so like my hair is all over the place i am red in the face and i just i look awful and this is what ends up immortalized of course <laughs> that's bad that's, that's, that's bad enough i mean i i looked like this this moon-faced assassin of joy yeah <laughs> <laughs> oh i love it yeah yeah i oh i don't know i don't know this this world is just it's, you know, a friend of mine says it's going to get a whole hell of a lot worse before it gets better. And, you know, I, I'm, I'm typically optimistic, but I, mm. I, I can't help but feel like I agree with him that it's, no, I, you know, I, I, don't agree. Know, I don't know. Oh, I, like, like 20 years ago, like I would have been feisty enough to like hop onto witch talk and be like, you're all wrong. And here's how. Mm -hmm. And I now understand like all of the folks who were like in their forties and fifties back then where they were just like, so exhausted that they're just like, you know what, you know what actually sounds good to me sitting with my feet up and yeah. reading a book yeah. and you'll figure it out or you won't. Or you won't. Yeah. And me telling you isn't going to change that anyway at all. So yeah. here I am reading my book. And you know, <laughs> you guys, you guys are like, Oh, you're so old. You look old. Da, 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 da. It's you guys making us look old because you're stressing us out and you're exhausting us. So it's your fault. So hey, hey I've earned every one of the, the yeah kind of. So, I've got so I've got silver. Actually, a lot more silver with yeah. with the pandemic. Like I've definitely noticed that. Where I'm like, all right, it is time. Yeah, yeah. So if you don't like it, it's your fault. So just stop, okay, mm -hmm. kids. Just stop. Um, you know, one thing I've been, you know, I I, I say a lot now and think a lot in my head especially when i'm on social media is okay you keep talking about it i you you talk i do like i i'm, I'm too busy yeah. to work <clears throat> you know and that's like like i don't i don't respond and you know and and as tempting as it is to be like you all are idiots like you you all need to not exist um first of all that's just rude um well but second, and, and I, don't, I just I can't be bothered. I I don't have the time. I don't have the energy. But like I'm I'm too busy doing the work, and and you're spending your time on social media talking about the work. Those are two very different things. And I know what I'd rather be doing. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I don't. I do not in any way want to like delegitimize the practice of someone simply because they're younger. Because I mean, I I wrote. A lot of the stuff that I that's like my seminal stuff from 18 on up like like yeah. that's how I've been doing the stuff that I've been doing as long as I have and also like there were there was a learning curve for a lot of that of course um and I don't know I think what you're saying makes the is probably the best thing to come down about it which is the ones with making all the noise if there's no substance behind it mm -hmm. it's just noise yeah yeah no ab absolutely and 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 that's the thing and 
you know, because I literally don't have the time to get into a, a Twitter battle with mm -hmm. you or anyone else because I'm busy anyway. Oh, you disappeared. I disappeared because there's a... Oh, you're Okay. No, you're still here. Um, I, I don't yeah, know. No, no, I, 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 a telephone call was trying to come through for oh. some reason. No, I didn't know if that, if that <laughs> meant like gone, gone, or nope. just had the video cut out. Um, but nope, no, I'm busy. that was a robo call. <laughs> okay. Between, between my, my business work and my like ritual work, like I'm too busy to do that shit anyway. So like, I, I'm going to leave you to talk about it and, and come up with your, crazy <laughs> appropriation theories and your my, practices and i'm just i'm gonna just keep doing the work you know because i could like on a slow day um i'm i'm really dedicated to my my daily um my daily practice and on a like slow day air quotes for those that can't see us um, I may only get in an hour of ritual work. Um, but like, I mean, you know, I, I have a business to run and if I'm busy, I'm busy. Obviously that has to take priority. So I can spend that hour on social media or I can spend it, you know, in temple doing ritual work. Guess what I'd rather be doing? No, I the more I think about it, it's less about somebody's age and what's really bothering me with some of the stuff on social media and especially like the, the videos, the hot take videos of things is some, anybody can get up there and just spew like, Ostara is, was actually a great German goddess that like, 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 like whatever, whatever crap that isn't actually true. Yeah. And it becomes very hard to include footnotes and a bibliography in that medium. Mm -hmm. And the misinformation will circle the globe, especially if it is virally interesting. Yeah. Whether it is uh, controversial or, or it, if it gets a, a visceral emotional response to someone, that's going to get like the loudest bullhorn which then means like tons of people are exposed to this bad information and most people don't know how to double check. Yeah. Like they don't know how to verify stuff. And most, honestly, a lot of people don't feel like they have the energy to do that. And I think that that's my biggest problem is like this bad information is just out there circling the globe, gets picked up, repeated and repeated and repeated without question mm -hmm. uh, with, with a rapidity that is mind boggling. And so we, before you know it, you've got people who have erased reality and now sort of exist much like television in their own little echo chamber of, it makes sense to them because everybody's talking about it yeah. and it is totally not how things really should work. Yeah, no, it's true. And you know, the sad thing though about that is, um, I think we touched on this, I, I feel in, um, our, our first episode together um a lot of a lot of uh nazi propaganda that you know exists in the world and you know in the pagan community in in the the you know magic community as a whole that gets spread around that is so inappropriate but you can't be bothered to research what you're hearing and seeing, but you're happy to spread it. Yeah. Knowing that, you know, where it originates from and, you know, to, to people that, you know, read books, you now are kind of portraying yourself as a racist, you know, because you don't know where this information is coming from. And, yeah, like if somebody's and I'm just sure if, if you did know Julius of Ola chapter and verse without examining the context. Yeah. And I'm I'm sure if you knew where X thing originated from, you wouldn't be repeating it because you're not actually a racist, but I'm hearing you spew all of this um 
all of this Nazi propaganda that does sound racist. I mean, that's one thing about, you know, racism. Um, it's not always overt, you know, it's mm -hmm. very insidious, um, especially when you're trying to get an entire civilization, an entire population on your side. Um, and where was I going with this? People should learn to double check resources. Oh, yes. They should uh, always do so. Yeah, because I'm sure you're not actually like racist, but I I just I just assume you are because that's all your that's all your your you're spewing on your on your um social media. And you're trying to be this great ally of 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 minorities everywhere. Meanwhile, you're like with, you know, gypsies reading tarot because that's apparently what they did because they invented it. That is culturally offensive to Roma people. So you think you're this great ally and you're just perpetuating a culturally offensive stereotype and you have no clue because you can't even be bothered to do a 30 second Google search on, on tarot. Like, I, you know, Wikipedia isn't the end all and be all of. Oh God, no! Oh, obviously, oh, 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 don't even get me started. Like, I but but if you, <laughs> if, but I'm sure I'm sure the Wikipedia page on tarot doesn't say, oh, yeah, gypsies invented tarot. I'm sure it's going to say that it was invented in uh, 15th century or 16th century Italy. You know what I mean? And check the sources. So, yeah. so my, 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 my bugbear about Wikipedia is especially uh, occult and magical. Like, like Wikipedia is so frequently vandalized mm -hmm. with intent. Yeah. Uh, most recently, uh, someone was trying to do some art of the, the symbols of the Goetia. And they, you know, very proudly sent me some ones. And I was like, this, this isn't, this isn't right. Did you add these bits? And they're like, oh no, it must be right. Like I, this is, this is from the Wikipedia page. Someone uh, has uploaded uh, a complete list of the 72 sigils and they changed every one of them slightly. They added a few little things here and there to make them wrong. And I don't know if it was intentional. I don't know if it's somebody like being like, ha ha, I'm getting one over people. Like, I don't know, but it's just wrong. And like, nobody has stopped to like, double check it i mean it could have been like a, a grimoire that's like these sigils shouldn't just be on here yeah. and 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 you know basically creating a blind yeah. that's possibly. that's that's fair and and the thing is like yeah it's it, it just it, it irks me because it's a really good indication of what is wrong with any of the things online yeah. that are community edited yeah yeah i mean it sounds good in theory um, it assumes that everyone is a is is a good faith actor. Yeah, that everyone yeah. has the intent of actually accurately sharing information. Yeah, and unfortunately, not everybody's very nice like that. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, <laughs> no, it's true. It's true. But the thing is, you know, and that's why I said, like, even even Wikipedia, for as as not a great resource as it is, but even yeah, there, I'm sure you know, it, it, unless someone actually li literally deliberately changes the entire page. Um, Which I might. <laughs> um, generally speaking, you're, you're probably going to get a fairly accurate, enough to be like, At oh, you know what? Start. I don't think that the whole terror reading gypsy thing is, is, is real. Um, so because it's saying here that it was invented in Italy. Um, so let me do a little bit more research. But, yeah. you know, they don't even go that far. They don't even invest that 30 seconds. They're, they're just like, oh, I heard this on the internet. It must be true. And now I'm just going to, you know, I'm going to be the next, the next um, warrior and ally and you know all the minorities can stay quiet because i'm shouting loud enough so yeah, i don't know <sighs> yeah. 
Dinner is a hot mess right now. Yes, it is. That's why I need everyone to get their vaccine mm -hmm. that is physically able to get a vaccine so I can leave my house <laughs> yes. and, and, and do things and um, uh, drive to Indiana and, and do some fun investigations so yeah. I don't have to be listening to people on Twitter or on Facebook. So everyone, get your vaccines now. Yeah, because I've got I've got Don't this for awesome you. library and yeah. ritual chamber, and it's mostly just me and Illyria, the cats, and all of the Keprian dead people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Don't don't get that vaccine for yourself. Don't get it for your family. Get it for me. Like, just get it for me. I'm cute, and I want to go out. So. Yeah. Yeah. I know, right? Your library. I mean, that that needs to be uh that needs to be visited. Yeah. You know, I mean it's 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 beautiful and it needs life. I mean, we, we haven't had Kiprian ritual in our ritual space since oh the last one in person was uh, February 2nd, 2020. Mm -hmm. Like we were right onto the, the equinox, right? And yeah. like, it was the week leading up to it. And I was like, this is looking, this is looking, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do a really hard thing and say nobody should come. Yeah. And, and then we went into lockdown and I was like, oh, that was hard, but that was the right call. Oh, because yeah. we, we had people coming in from like, you know, yeah, New yeah, yeah. And, like all over the place. Yeah. I think we only missed Beltane. It could have been Spring Greek Knox. I can't remember. We missed one. We went virtual. I'm pretty sure it was Beltane. And then uh, we met up again for the next few ones. Because here, I mean, I well, first of all, just the cases of Canada were just low anyways but where i live i mean it's it's a small city like we're only like a hundred thousand people i think it's like 120 130 when you know you include the outlying areas but it's also we're pretty isolated as well yeah. but then you know fall came around and it started to get bad and so yeah i i, I can't remember what our last ritual was but it's been a year since our last yeah. ritual. We were gonna get together for uh, the summer solstice um, outside because we can now have, well, this was, uh, we're, we started phase two yesterday, so I don't know if the numbers have changed, but when we went into phase one, we are now allowed to have outdoor gatherings of up to uh, 10 people from um, multiple households. Mm -hmm. So we were going to get together for a physical ritual outdoors and it rained all day. So we went virtual. We've had such a crappy summer here. So yeah, it's been it's pretty rain. much nonstop rain here too. But we had a really mild winter and we get the same amount of precipitation for the most part every year. So if it doesn't come as snow in the wintertime, it comes as rain. So mm. as much as I like a mild winter, because I'm not a winter person, I, you just know like, okay, that it's great. It's not minus 40. So that's wonderful. Mm. But come summer, it's not gonna be days on end of clear skies and sunshine and high temperatures, you know? But I feel like we're on our way to becoming the next North American rainforest over here. <laughs> it's, yeah. it's, it's hotter than usual. It's muggy and it's just, just constantly wet. Yeah. Yeah, and th that's the problem because it'll, you know, it'll be kind of warm. It'll cool down so you know the rain's coming. It's going to rain. Then it heats back up. So now it's super humid. And it just, that's all it's been doing. That's all it's been doing. And like this heat dome, you know, to the West, yeah. that sucks for them. I mean, there's so many people dying in BC Um from heat from that are that's heat related because like a lot of um canadians don't have air conditioning um 
because for for the most part we kind of really don't need it yeah well and, and pretty much most of the pacific northwest is the same like normally it's not something that you have to worry yeah. about and and your your buildings are designed to keep heat in you know because i mean and even in bc like they don't get like the snow and the cold like other parts of canada but still um you know our buildings are, are designed to keep heat in so with this heat dome. Oh, and you know, uh, light and be lit, lit in BC, um, broke. Oh, up. yeah, what 121 degrees Fahrenheit? Yeah, yeah, unreal. Um, so it was 49.7 or 49.5 Celsius, something like that. So that's the hottest recorded temperature in Canada. Uh, I'm not going to say ever, but since records began. So that just happened. And now, as of yesterday evening, they had to evac evacuate the entire town because a wildfire came rushing through and well, was... at least 90% of the town is completely wiped out. Wow. So they're just, you know, pandemic, heat dome, and now a wildfire. And it's it's just yeah it's it's not good it's you know and and they have like eighty wildfires in BC going on right now sixty four yeah, just sixty four developed just in the past twenty four hours. Discovery you know? Plus had me do this Nostradamus series and you know they focused like each one on the different disasters mm -hmm. yeah. foretold. And I mean I I I had a great aunt who was super into Nostradamus so I was like yay I get to use like a. a Another part of my wheelhouse that I never talk about because it's usually wrapped up with some pretty weird conspiracy theory mm -hmm. end yeah. of days Armageddon stuff. Yeah. But um, there's a letter that Nostradamus wrote to his son that I honestly, in reading it in the original French, find even more distressing than than his hundreds of quatrains because he's like couching so much stuff in there that like unless you can can deconstruct his weird astrological associations most of it could be anything right but this letter to his son he's pretty clear that that basically like climate change is coming we're going to do these things to the planet here's what's going to happen and i mean he's describing like and he's like I don't know if it's 100 years or if it's 300 years but like just prepare for this and i'm reading it going it's really hard not to look around and go, yeah, yeah, bro, yeah. here we are. It wasn't your part of the millennia, but it sucks. Yeah, yeah. And, yeah. and just describing how people, uh, you know, as, as arable land uh, is, is destroyed, as crops are destroyed, as fire consumes things, as people start to turn on one another because of it, and, and just kind of looking around going, yep, so... What's, what's the meme now? Don't think of it as the hottest summer of your life. Think of it as the coolest summer of the rest of your life. Oh, God. You know, that's scary. That, that's To think about it that way is really scary. You know, I hated celebrating the mild winter because, I mean, there, you're going to get mild winters that aren't related to climate change. It just... Yeah, but you know, but um, I I still it's kind of like it, it's kind of hard to celebrate this mild winter because I know where it's coming from, you know. Yeah, with and, with the exception of some brief stints in Dallas and Phoenix, I've lived in in this area of Ohio my whole life, and in the course of my lifetime, it has been undeniable that the climate here and the seasons and the way things has changed. Like it's just changed in visibly in the past 20 years. Yeah. Uh, so however you want to say that's happening, I think it's impossible to deny that it is happening. Like whatever the cause is, I think the cause is pretty freaking obvious too. But if you want to get like political and contentious about that, there's no denying this is not normal. Yeah. Yeah. I know, I know, and there, yeah, and there's nothing we can do about it. I'm, you know, as as regular citizens, you know, with all the protests and the political pressure on on the politicians, you know, what that political pressure has done is to 
make politicians go from ignoring climate change to acknowledging climate change to vowing to do something about climate change but talk is just that talk yeah you know so you know it, it, it's kind of hard to for me to kind of like oh no we just need to really get on our politicians and we can do this as people because it's becoming more and more obvious like with uh with us up here all of these mass graves um in the um uh former residential schools mm -hmm. of of all these these children um as, as all of these are being found and listening to our prime minister who is also currently dragging all the living indigenous children to court as we speak while at the same time the same day that they were actually in court he was like no that's not happening i'm not doing that um so while we're we're finding all these dead indigenous babies and while the prime minister is dragging all of these indigenous kids to court He's like, oh, the change, oh, blah, 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 blah. But that's that's just it. It's just talk. And you know it's just talk because nothing has changed. And it's, you know what I mean? It's just oh, so it's it's like the states. We killed them and we're just gonna name a street after them. I mean, like, like that's that's the reality of it. Yeah. <clears throat> and yeah. I <sighs> I, yeah, uh, I, just, I just, you know, I just like, I, I, I know no matter what, how many protests or how, how, my, how, you know, how I changed my life to be more environmentally friendly, there's not much I can do about it. As, that as is a mentioned. drop in the bucket. Yeah. It has to come from the corporations. Yeah. It has to come from a much, much, and, and yeah. the reality is that the shape of the society we all live in would have to change, has to change so significantly for this to be staved off. Yeah. that I don't know that anybody, A, has the will to do it, and B, the folks who have the actual power are invested in just sweeping it under the rug, hoping yeah. for the best and making as much money as they can in the meantime, yeah. so that at least once everything is burning, they have their little like retreat in New Zealand or wherever they have projected is gonna be safe. Yeah, exactly. It, exactly. I think we've already just, we, we have already passed the point of being able to do anything substantially about it and are at the point where there's people who are like, I'm getting mine. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Cause you know, the ones in power are the ones that can, can actually do something about it. And they've known about it for years. They made their choices, but they're in the position to, you know, have their safe retreat wherever. They're gonna be fine. It's all good, you know? And the rest of us are just gonna be burning or underwater. And that's just the way it's gonna be, you know? Shape of the world will not be the same. It already is not. And yeah. Well, can we do, but just kind of keep doing. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. And on that happy note. Yeah, I was going to say we're, we're, we're gloomy gusses at the moment. I know, right? After, after so much fun <sighs> gossip and, and behind the scenes at uh, look at Paranormal State and Port of Sahel, then we just went, we just mm. went down. We just went back. dark. <laughs> I mean, on, on the other hand, like, okay, rather, we're, we are, we are folks who do magical work. Yeah. If all else fails, do some fucking magic. Like, it can't hurt. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, well, you know, the thing about that is, um, when, when, so when Trump was running for president and that whole bind Trump movement came about, 
and you know everyone with everyone and uh, uh, twitter oh my god every month when it was happening everyone's like oh i'm doing my bind trump spell blah 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 and i okay that's great i mean you know if, if you think you are gonna change things by waving a baby carrot in front of a picture of trump knock yourself out but let's be honest that was the Bind Trump movement was a marketing tool to sell a book. Like that's just that's just how it is. Sorry, folks. I mean, uh, I think it could also be good therapy because when when you're powerless, magic has always been the recourse of the marginalized. Yeah, it's been a way of of trying to subvert. You know, when, the, when you have no other option but subversive power, magic has been what you what you fall back to. Yeah, to, but, to, to attempt to get some kind of control over your life. Yeah, the world but, but waving a baby carrot in front of a picture of Trump once a month isn't going to do jack shit. And I don't care how many people are doing it because you know, uh, people that never picked up uh, a magic wand in their life were were getting in on this because it sounded good you know and and they were also scared you know and desperate people do desperate things so people that have never done a spell before doesn't surprise me that they're going to get on you know this whole bind trump movement uh bandwagon thing um but it requires more than that once ever working or you, you know what i mean mm -hmm. um it, it it needs it needs to become a part of your not daily routine but a part of your regular if if, if you think you're going to affect nations and politicians if you if you're you need to pull out the big guns you know what i mean um, mm. <laughs> Donald Trump is so far outside your your sphere of influence that you need to pull up the big guns. And I had forgotten getting back on the Anakian uh, conversation. I had forgotten about the ninety one. Um, um, well, there's you know some people call them governors, and some people say that they're the names of the ninety one. Um, regions of, of the earth that uh, de-identified, you know, through his, his workings. Um, and I forgot about that until yesterday and was like, you know what? There are like ready-made mechanisms mm. that are big scale that we have at our disposal that we really should be using you know um if i if you know if i'm that concerned about a political issue or like the environment or whatnot and i know this tool exists um that is designed for these big scale issues shouldn't i be using it you know, and yeah, so now I'm I'm having to kind of brush up on all that Anakian and, uh, you know, s start doing some work. The well, I hope you have better luck than I do. All the things that I work with have pretty much been like, this is going to happen. This is just oh, supposed to happen. Just. Wait. Well, see, that's the thing. I, I, I'm torn between. I mean, I don't mind doing the work. Yeah. Um, with kind of like in the back of my head, thinking, okay, but I kind of think this whole shit scenario is is meant to happen, needs to happen. You know. Um, yeah, like, and I don't know if that's me being fatalistic because I I can be very cynical, but yeah. like, like there's 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 certain directions in which magically I can push, and there's certain directions where it's like, don't muck with this; you'll actually make it worse. Yeah, and, and I'll oh. be like, oh, oh, okay, 
Well, um, that, yeah, I don't have like, the full picture. Yeah, that's the thing because, like, I'm I I typically tend to be like the eternal optimist, where it's like, no, we can do this. We just got to do this, and it doesn't have to be this way. And it could be so much better. Blah blah blah. Utopia. Blah blah blah. Uh, so for me to be like, you know, it, I, I feel like there's indications like this is inevitable because it's it's meant to be. It has to happen. Um, is atypical for me, you know, so it's not your fatalism or, or cynicism, I don't think, I mean, I'm, yeah, I could be wrong. Um, but I don't know, it's just, you know, and that's the thing, like, I, you know, I'm a big believer on, you know, doing magic within your, your sphere of influence. And, um, you know, like, a, like, a, and and we know because like when this whole bind Trump movement came about, so then all of these magicians were like, "Oh, we're going to do spells of protection for Trump." So, and you have yeah, all now these, we're all just these, walk, working across purposes. Yeah, and and you have all the evan and evangelicals praying for Trump. So, and and but, let's be honest, working magic and just acting like that's normal. Uh, <laughs> demon semen lady, don't even get me started. Yikes. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, how, how influential are you going to be, you know, with the big issues and, and the big people? I don't know. Honestly, I don't know. I, I, so, I, I don't know. Like I'm, I'm not, I'm not Wiccan by any stretch. So like the whole, like, you know, and it harm none, blah, blah, blah. That is not quite how, how I work. Um, right. I mean, consent and, and things are pretty important, but, uh, and, and actually I think it's probably just an extent of, of consent. So I've, I've never really, outside of like people I teach, um, tried to articulate this, but there's any, any type of working that I do, no matter what system of magic I'm working with, there's a point where I sort of like kind of put feelers out into the warp and the weft of reality mm -hmm. and go, is this possible? Like, like what pieces do I need to move and, and, and shape and like can I do this should I do this and if I feel something kind of push back like like sometimes as subtle as the surface tension of water so you have to be very careful but like mm, no yeah no and and it's not necessarily no that's bad uh it's more you don't know all the pieces mm-hmm and you can't predict how this action, like if you take this action, there will be unintended consequences. Yeah. And you can definitely, I, I, it is possible to push past that and do the work thing anyway. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I have learned through many years of doing this that indeed there are unintended consequences yeah. when you push yeah. and you get that sort of like reality, whatever, whatever, whether it's a, for me, I experience it not as, clear as a god or a goddess or or even like a an anthropomorphized voice it's just this this sense of like something just kind of pushing back a little bit of like mm -mm, mm, no yeah. yeah uh and i've just learned don't mess with that like yeah. probability says this is not the working for you yeah uh, and like there's a few things that i can kind of like poke and steer at and it, it, it feels like chipping away at a much bigger thing but there's a lot of machinery there's a lot of there is an overwhelming sense of many fingers in these pots yeah, yeah. And each one of them is pulling on different threads and strings yeah. and many of them are working at cross purposes and i think we underestimate the amount of uh well developed educated magic perhaps by other terms that is being employed by multiple different factions in all of this. Like we are not, I, I think sometimes people who are like, I'm a witch, I'm, I'm an occultist. Like we, we feel so um, isolated and so unique, especially in the culture that we grow, grew mm -hmm. up in, that we, we assume nobody else practices this stuff. Like, like, like this is, we are the outliers. Like nobody yeah. can do this. Certainly no one in power, no one in the mainstream. Well, they might not call it the same thing, and they might, who freaking knows. Yeah. Um, 
but don't ever make the mistake of assuming you're the only one working something. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And I mean, also too, with like, like big issues like climate change, um, I think it's impossible for you to really grasp the oh, unintended consequences. Like the so big, many moving parts. Yeah. I mean, just, just to be, call a storm, just to call a storm, there are so many moving parts. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. I mean, the bigger the issue, the more, um, the harder it's going to be for you to be able to grasp um, and understand the, the unintended consequences. So it, you know, you just, you just feel like you're damned if you do, you're damned if you don't. Um, well, it's, it's also something that I, it, it's sort of the luxury of being uh, an earlier, uh, less seasoned practitioner where you don't know all the consequences. So you don't think about them. You don't stop. You're just like, I have this idea and I have the will. Boom. And you sort of like happen to reality. Yeah. And that's how we all have some very interesting stories about like, you know, citywide power outages or, you know, three storms that converged out of nowhere because it was a bet among friends about who could give somebody a snow day. Not yeah. that I'm talking about an actual thing. And no, you know, no, no, no. Never. No. Uh, yeah. yeah. And but, I but think like, there's this that, that thing where like when you don't know any better, you can almost do more because you don't stop yourself and go, but should I? Yeah. It's it's the it's the drunk driver that never gets injured. Yeah, you know, um, it's it's the same sort of con concept, and you can tell who has the interesting stories based on how they talk about big issues like this. What are the unintended consequences? I can't even grasp the unintended consequences on a matter so large. If you hear someone talking like that, you know they have some pretty interesting stories because if you've never had to deal with the unintended consequences, you don't think about the unintended consequences. Yeah, and, and we're not talking like, oh, oops, some books fell over. Yeah. No, it's the, oh my God, I think this shit is real and I just did that. Yeah. Fuck. Yeah, now what? What does that mean? Oh, oh my God, what are, what are the moral implications? Oh my God. <laughs> like, yeah i didn't expect that in my response oh shit okay. yeah yeah so you know so yeah those 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 things that keep you up at night sometimes yeah so think of that but on a global scale and, well, and, and it's some people will be like well if you can do magic or if you're psychic why can't you predict the lottery numbers I'm like first of all can you think of how many people consciously or unconsciously are grabbing at that and trying yeah. to influence that that's not like, magic. I, I did. To to the amount of work that you would have to put in as one individual to overcome all the, even just yeah. the unconscious people. I did magically come up with the lotto numbers. I, I, I did it with my six numbers. I asked for the winning six numbers. I got the winning six numbers. But 10 million other people consciously or unconsciously did the same thing. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Uh, Doreen Virtue in one of her novels, and I can't remember if it was Sea Priestess or Moon Magic. I can't remember which one. Her character explains magic as, as a force so well. And, you know, um, well, why can't you use magic to win the lottery? And the way she explains magic as a weak force and the, the lottery um, uh, thing in particular, you know, there's so many people that, you know, let's say you have, you know, a thousand magicians and another 5,000 like knowingly psychic people and another 10,000 very psychic people that don't know they're psychic and then another... 20,000 people that are psychic because everyone's psychic to one degree or another. They're all working those same mm -hmm. six numbers. You know what I mean? But she explains it so well, so concisely and so clearly from like from a magical practitioner to a non-magical practitioner. And that's what makes that whole part of the book so valuable um, because She's explaining it from 
someone with knowledge to someone without knowledge. And it just made so much sense, uh, made it so easy to understand. And it was such a brilliant part of the book. But it is like magic is a weak force, you know? Um, and no, I'm, chances are I'm not going to, the six numbers that I pull magically, psychically, whatever, chances are they're not going to be the winning numbers because, you know, it's just, you know, the odds. And there's there's so many minds on it. The ultimate the yeah. end result is, is just still chaos. Exactly. <clears throat> Exactly. You know, and yeah. And I also find too, like, I mean, I've never been, <laughs> never, I just had this conversation with uh, uh, my friend, uh, Frater RC. Um, hmm. it, it was in relation to something, uh, an, an Enochian working that, oh, I can talk about this. So um, we uh, have a, like an online group and, um, uh, isn't that always the fun thing where it's like i have this wait can i tell this story yeah, how much yeah. of this story can i tell yeah oh, yeah so my my friend frat rc um has his um hermetic mystery school uh website and you can join and take classes with him in this group and it's a lot of fun and i mean he's so, oh he's gonna hear this because he's such a huge fan of yours so i know he's gonna listen to this episode i was just gonna say, so yeah <laughs> um uh, he's so brilliant and uh, like he, he, um, he's GD and he, he started in a GD temple at 16. Like, I'm not going to tell his story, but anyway, he's, he's brilliant. He's just, he's, he's so brilliant. So, magical rock star. Go yeah. Ahead. Yeah. Yeah. That, yeah. He's a magical rock star. So anyways, um, um, so he's doing this fun stuff with, with this group. So I, I joined them and, um, the first session that I joined, um, we decided to invoke uh, Kamara and King Kamara and Prince Haganel. Uh, and with um, Sigilt and, and with the intel with the intention of asking what what colors the, the sigil should be. And um, you know, he's like, you, you know, you can ask for something, blah, 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 blah. And so we start with um, Enoch's prayer. And, and then, you know, you move on to the invocations. And so during Enoch's prayer, I'm like, you know, I'm going to ask King Kamar, like, if I keep doing what I'm doing with my business, like, it's going to stay, you know, viable and, you know. Uh, like, I don't have to do anything, you know, major changes for it to, you know, not crash. And maybe I'll ask, you know, uh, Prince Hagenel just for a little boost in, in my business. And I'm like, nah, no, I, no <laughs> I'm not going to ask these because I know the answer that I want. I know um, I want King Kamar to be like, oh, you're good. Just keep doing what you're doing that's the answer I want here. So if that's the answer I get, I'm going to doubt it. Mm -hmm. I know that's the answer I want. If I don't hear the answer that I want, if he's like, well, actually things are going to happen. So you're going to have to change your business model, how you go about doing things. If you want to keep your business viable, I'm going to doubt it as well. And probably not make any changes. And mm -hmm. And it may end up being too late. You know what I mean? So I'm like, I'm just, yeah, just going to get the colors for the sigil. No big deal. So we do the working, blah, blah, blah. It's all good. We finish, close down. I eat something, you know. Then I go to my computer and I look and there's an email. And the email came in at 9.02 p.m. Well, at 9.02, we were in the process of invoking Prince Hagenel. And... Who is the email from? It is from a company that wants to distribute my products in China and Hong Kong and mm -hmm. the rest of Asia. You know, because you just need to be like up to your neck in beeswax for like the next 30 years. Like yeah. just 
yeah. literally tons of it. Yeah. So <laughs> I I got what I asked for without asking for it, although I was thinking about it. That's enough. And I and, and, and realizing that that's, that's enough. But here's the thing, and this is why I'm telling the story, is because I'm not greedy. I would never be like, oh, give me the lottery numbers. Um I and you know, I don't do a lot of money magic or prosperity magic for myself. I've never really needed to. Um I I I find that because I I kind of maintain a good daily spiritual practice that I find that it's almost like you know living a healthy lifestyle where you're keeping a good immune system like you're 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 preventing getting a cold as opposed mm -hmm. to popping the pills when you get a cold. So I I've never been greedy in, in any of my asks on the rare occasion that I do have asks. So I think, you know, the two of them were like, you know, he technically didn't ask it, although we know that's what he wants. Um, he didn't ask. He's not a dick, or at least he's not being a dick to yeah. us. Um, he's not being greedy. He asks for a little boost and he just doesn't want his business to fail. You know, like his question was, you know, like, can I just keep doing what I'm doing and stay successful? So let's yeah, give, him, let's give him, yeah, let's give him a little bit, you know, yeah, I really, I can't, I cannot and overstate I the usefulness of just regular daily prep, basically making your magic what you do every day. Yeah. Yeah. Without fanfare, just with as as part of what you're doing, or as much like, fanfare as you want. You can make it as yeah. simple or as complicated yeah. as you want. I mean, I I go on full robe, mm. full temple uh, mm. regalia on a daily basis, but that's just when you know. I mean, there's I mean, times in my you, life you do where, whatever works for you. I I I'm, I'm less tower. like trappings but because most of my work is not in this thing at all yeah um so it's more about like what i do to my spaces which i at this point like it's it's easy to tell that like my space around me is fairly important because yeah. it's sort of like the central part of the, the rest of the, what i'm doing mm -hmm. yeah i find for me personally well first of all i mean i like pomp and ceremony period but i find if i go you know, more full-on regalia, I slow down, I mm. really slow down in mind and body, which is what I really, really need in life is to really slow down and to walk slow and to speak slow and to move slow. And if I'm going to go through all the effort of setting up you know, the ritual space and the robes and everything, then I'm, I'm not going to half-ass it and do mm -hmm. a 10 minute thing. I'm going to, I'm going to do my full daily work and, mm -hmm. you know, um, it just, it, it, it helps in, in, in that sense. Um, yeah. But I, you know, I, 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 I find that, having like that regular daily practice just it's it's um spiritual maintenance just like physical maintenance of of maintaining a good immune system so you don't get sick so you know so they 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 did me a solid because i'm not constantly seek, seeking out this spirit and that spirit and this angel and that angel money 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 you know what i mean um yeah. You know, I was like, oh, maybe I'll ask. No, I'm, I'm not. No, I'm not going to ask. I'm just, I just want colors. So angels, demons, climate collapse, and some juicy stuff behind the scenes of paranormal state. <laughs> I think it's a good episode. For, that makes for a really, really good episode. Absolutely. Yes. Absolutely. Very well-rounded. And uh, two and a half hours. I mean, that's, yeah. Um, yeah, not too short, not too long. Yeah, I think. I think that's a good place to stop. Absolutely. Absolutely. So on that note, 
thank you for being my first uh, returning guest. I really appreciate it. Um, it was really nice to really finish off that story, though, because we really, yeah. um, we cut scene at the best mm. part um, last yeah. episode. So, yeah. So uh, we kept the audience hanging. So that was pretty good. Okay. So. As usual, you pulled out some, some interesting insight into my own practice that I don't normally talk about. So some, some juicy stuff for folks who know and like have a, a deeper appreciation for some of the ins and outs of magic. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. I'm, I'm, apparently I'm good at that because I've had, mm -hmm. I've had um, almost half of my guests um, like email me or text me or whatever afterwards saying like, you just pulled stuff out of me that I never talk about and I never tell people. So apparently that's my gift. Friendly, disarming, you make a great space, so. Yeah, well, thank you, thank you. Um, so all of your links, mm -hmm. websites, social media, everything, I'm putting in the show notes. So, you know, for everyone that's listening or watching, you know, be sure to check out um, all of those links, follow Michelle on social media, um, uh, you know, especially like like Facebook and 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 Instagram, um, you can take part in the uh, the weekly connection ritual, which is a lot of fun, and I so look forward to that now. It's really a great way for me to like end my week and and end that day Saturday. Um, so that's that's always perfect. And uh, yeah, so check out all the links, website that I provide in the show notes, mm -hmm. follow Michelle all across social media. And thank you once again, my dear. I really appreciate you coming on and all of your fantastic stories. And thank you. Um, happy Canada Day and happy Independence Day, which is hopefully we don't burn the country down while we're I putting off fireworks during a drought. <laughs> Yeah. Other than where I'm at. I know, right? Um, well, we'll know before this episode actually airs. Yeah. So you never know. There is one thing, since you were talking about telling interesting real stories through fiction, mm -hmm. I have a short story coming out in an anthology um, by Aaron French. And the anthology is called There Is No Death, There Is No Dead, or There Are No Dead. Um, it's due out, I think, in August. Okay. Um, it, I'm in there, Shannon McGuire, Laird Barron, a whole bunch of other heavy hitters. It's all about spirit communication. And, and that was really like the only thing was, was spiritualism, spirit communication, write a story about that. Okay. And without hyperbole, I believe it is the best piece of short fiction I have written probably in my career. Oh. Because of how genuine it is, how own voice it, 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 there's, there's a lot of pieces that come together in it. I'm really thrilled with it. It's called The Shape of Her Soul. Okay. So if folks enjoy fiction with a side of magic and, and, and whatever, uh, there is no dead, there, there is no death, there are no dead. Um, and I'll be, I'll be blasting it out, but that short okay. piece okay. is in there and I'm really quite proud of it. Okay. So what I'll do is I'll Google that title and get a couple of links to put up so people can like i assume it's going to be on amazon yeah. and whatnot so yeah I, I think right now it'll take you to like an indiegogo campaign but oh, it will okay. be available on amazon and everything else um this is the same person who did the demons of solomon book uh so okay you know, okay does right. does anthologies on nifty occult and magical topics but fiction yeah uh, which okay. lets me you know stretch stretch those wings yeah, 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 yeah. That's awesome. Okay, so whatever, like, if I, whatever uh, link I come across, um, yeah. if, if it's Indiegogo, like, whatever, I'll just, I'll post that as well in the show notes. So that's great. Awesome. Is there anything else that you want to uh, promote um, in particular? No. Anything new? No. No, okay. I mean, that, that's pretty much the, the next big thing that I'm allowed to talk about. Like, there's, right. there's other stuff always, but like that one, since it's coming out in August, that's the next new one. And I, really had a lot of fun writing it and want it want, want people to read it awesome it's, okay. a good, it's a good little story oh that's fantastic all right okay well then um on that note have a good night and you as well. have a good weekend and yeah don't burn down your country because that just yeah that just sucks yeah. yeah okay fingers crossed yeah no kidding okay bye bye
Thank you for listening to this episode of The Lux Files. You'll find all the guest links in the show notes, as well as the link www.laylokanzawin.com slash links. That link will get you to my page of links, where you can then go to my Laylokanzawin website, the Lux Files page, and my Laylokanzawin YouTube channel that has all the Lux Files videos. It also has all my social media links there, so you can follow me and the Lux Files. And don't forget to subscribe to the Lux Files wherever you get your podcasts. And lastly, if you enjoyed this episode, please consider leaving me a review. Until next time.